evening and welcome to the Thursday, October 4th, 2018 regular meeting of the school committee. I would ask those in the audience to please rise as we say this Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So I will just go over our agenda briefly before we get started. We will have a period for recognitions and public comments, our reports as usual. Then we have some uh, new business. We have a leadership conference for the High School Business Professionals of America, the World's Ro Robotic Tournament, the Middle School Robotic World's Tournament, and then we have some positions at the high school that Mr. Bishop will present. And then we have some school committee policies that we are going to go over. We're going to discuss the budget message from our meeting last week with the uh, Board of Selectmen. And then we will discuss uh, turf field uh, oversight committee. And then we have some old business revisiting some policies that we have already seen here. And then we'll revisit the um, school committee newsletter. And then we will have a chance to go over the school committee website review uh, again for a second second time on that and then we will have a chance to discuss any future agenda items and a second opportunity for public comment so with that um, I Um, we have heard you, and even those who couldn't respond or didn't respond, we hope to hear from you in the future. And I think the onus is now on us as leadership, as policymakers and administration, um, to work with all these diverse voices to create a more inclusive, accepting, and supportive community in our schools. Well said. Thank you. Well said. Thank you. Any other recognitions? I don't know if you guys had any. But, um, all right, with that, we have our first opportunity for public comment. Uh, we appear not to have a large public tonight. Uh, so we will, and we also, uh, we don't have any school committee, uh, school council reps either, do we? Oh, we do. Okay, so we'll come back to them and go into the assistant superintendents, assistant superintendents report. technological difficulties tonight. So um, Carol asked me a couple of weeks ago if I would mind sharing some of the MCAS information with all of you tonight, um, which I was happy to do. Um, when I was thinking about how to put it together and talking about it with Carol, um, the question came to my mind, how much do we share and how do we share? Because there is just simply so much information for all of us to take in. And um, the way that I could best equate it in my mind and make it make sense was to really talk about this is a story. And it's an ongoing story, and it's one of many stories that we will be telling in terms of our students and how our students are progressing and achieving um, over time. So I kind of divided this up into chapters. So the first chapter is when MCAS comes out, we all hear from the Commissioner of Education, and this is where we are, and this, this is the status, and it's kind of like the build up to the opening of a movie. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming, and there's all kinds of trainings and memos and webinars um, to get us all ready for um, what is to come and how we can best understand and use this information. Um, clearly, MCAS is one of many data points that we all use, um, but also clearly it is the most public and the most um, publicly consumed in this state. Um, so because of that, we, we really want to make sure that we attend to it and, and pay careful attention. So um, what has changed this year is essentially almost everything. The way the kids take the test, the way we report the test, the way districts are held accountable, it's all different. So uh, the MCAS is divided into two sections. And what we have is legacy MCAS, which is the MCAS that we kind of all grew up with.
the two. And we've been um, told through the people who create the metrics and put this all together that we're not to equate proficient with meets expectations. data and look at large group of students. Um, but now what we're really being asked to do is that same work that we've always done historically, but we're also asked now to look at our lowest performing students. And um, you know, it's really hard if you're a district where you're scoring 99th percentile and the state says to you, improve. And it's really hard to imp improve from 99 when you're already kind of at the top. So you'd see districts, very high performing districts like ours, who could never really hit an improvement target because you were already kind of at the ceiling. And so now they're asking us, how do we look at this differently? How do we look at all of our students um, and make sense for all of them and, and ma make sure their instruction is whole and what they need? Um, so, you know, again, with that, the, we're all being advised. Um, we really can't equate any historical accountability levels. So schools where we're a level one school, we're a level two school. That whole system has really kind of gone out the window. Um, and we only really have one year right now to compare with this new MCAS, um, with the next generation. It's 2017 to 2018. So it's going to take some time to create trends, see patterns, and really gauge progress and accountability over time. Um, but in the meantime, with this change, um, we're still looking at data and we're still trying to make sense of all of it and use it in a meaningful way for our students. So this is essentially what we looked at in the past, the levels that I just referred to. And we're still, to a certain extent, in science using these legacy levels. So um, the science is still, science is kind of a strange hybrid at this point of the old standards and the new standards, and we're moving forward. So science is still using the legacy um, achievement levels, whereas everything else is using the next generation achievement levels. Um, and you'll see the numbers, the number values have changed. Um, we go up into the 500s now where it, you know, before we went up to 280 was the highest, now it's 560. So it's just a completely different set of um, criteria in the way we're looking at things. Um, I think even the way that they've named the achievement levels makes a statement about how we're looking at our students. We're really looking at student performance based on benchmarks and standards um, and expectations for each grade level. Um, so I think the, the naming of the achievement level kind of speaks to how we're looking at students um, and our expected progress for them. So um, this is my way of saying the next slides look more challenging. Um, and I think they're challenging for all of us right now. Um, you know, I just went to a meeting with a lot of area assistant superintendents and everyone is having the same conversations. You know, what do you have? What does it mean? Um, things that people agree with, things that people don't agree with. And I think the state is doing the same thing. They're looking at the data, um, helping us to make sense of it and figuring out what's going to stay the same and what will change moving forward. So when we look at our students' achievement and the things that we are accountable for, um, a, individual schools will have an accountability rating, but districts right now do not. But so kind of the title of this slide, when I talk about accountability as our entire district, I'm talking about our accountability to students and our achievement um, with all of our students and the expectations. So the different indicators that are contributing to our students' growth and achievement um, and the way we look at our schools and district um, is academic achievement. So how did our students score on the test itself? Um, academic growth, how do we compare where they fell this year to where they fell last year? Um, and that was also known as student growth percentile or SGP, one of our acronyms for short. Um, what we really like to see is students who are making great achievement gains and great growth gains. So we expect um, student growth, um, generally the average that we expect would be 40% to 60% growth from one year's time to the next. Um, and that's our SGP. So we look at achievement, we look at growth. Um, kind of a new area that we're looking with at the MCAS is, or in the MCAS is our English language proficiency and what progress have our L students demonstrated. 
student attendance, so also um, not very kindly titled chronic, chronic absenteeism. And that is one I can um, tell you for sure that chronic absenteeism is one area that all districts are talking about and complaining about. Um, it's es essentially, um, they're looking at a 10%. So if, you, if students have greater than 10% absences over the course of the year, which is 18 days, they're considered chronically absent. And there are many, many reasons for students to have excessive absences, and some of them are very legitimate. Um, and that ranking is kind of held against you. So many districts have not met their achievement or their accountability target for chronic absenteeism. Um, and actually, I had a conversation with someone at DESE today, and they said I was one of many people who was calling to question that. Um, so I think that's something that probably will be discussed at the state level. Um, surely, we can always do as much as we can to encourage attendance and. And I have some thoughts about that too, and I'm sure our principals do as well. Um, but again, that's that's a new area that we're looking at in terms of MCAS results this year. Um, our high school completion rate and advanced course completion. So advanced course completion are things like students who take the AP ex AP classes, AP exams, international baccalaureate, um, any type of college um, level class at the high school level. Um, another interesting thing that we learned this year is if you take and if a student takes an advanced class um, in their sophomore year, that doesn't count in our data of students taking these advanced classes. It only counts for junior and senior year. And the state had, there was a lot of pushback and question on that, but that's the way it is right now. Um, junior and senior year advanced courses. So all of these factors are considered when the state kind of puts all of this together. So the state takes these four areas, achievement, student growth, English language proficiency, and the additional indicators like chronic absenteeism, and it weights each of these areas. Um, each is given a certain um, percentage of importance, for lack of a better word. So they also have to look at um, whether your district has L students, because one of the areas relates to Ls. Um, and some so you have to have at least 20 Ls in your district in order to be in the with ELL column and your percentages are calculated one way because you've got 10% of your overall achievement um, is based on your, the, the achievement of your L students. If your district has fewer than 20 Ls, then your percentages and your calculations change just slightly um, because obviously that area is blacked out. And actually, I should have clarified. So this and it says right on there, but this is not high schools, grades three to eight. Obviously, there are other indicators um, that are only applicable to high schools. So achievement, student growth are still the same. EL is still the same. Um, but then we look at things like high school completion, dropout rate, um, extended engagement rate are students who we want to make sure if they go an additional year in high school that they're actually finishing up in a five-year plan and that we're not extending students' stay in high school um, beyond a five-year um, period of time. Um, so again, you can see at the high school level where there are more indicators how the percentages in terms of how the state kind of puts it all together changes. So again, this is just another way of looking at um, kind of the same things that the state looks at, um, and they've divided it up again into the non-high schools and the high school and middle schools. Um, and when we get right down into the scores, we're looking at the ELA scores, math, science. Um, here we're looking at growth in ELA and math. They don't show growth over science. The science test is spread out um, too far across um, too many grade spans. And so the state looks at all of these different areas. They've set a target for your district in terms of how are you doing with your progress with your L's? How are you doing with your progress with your growth in ELA or your growth in math? And they, how are you doing with your um, student absenteeism? And they assign you a number for each of those areas. So you either exceed your target that the state has set for you, or you, know, you can go all the way down to you've done not as well. Um, and in some cases, you can do just slightly not as well as the target has indicated for you, and you still get zero. Um, so you know, this, it, and some of, those, some of those things are kind of a hard pill for us to swallow when you look at two numbers and they look, wow, I bet one or two more kids um, might have really made the difference. But then again, that's where the state's saying to us, Let's really look hard at our individual students, our individual subgroups and cohorts. Um, so the targets for the 2018 MCAS were based on our 2017 performance 
and we've been told by the state that very shortly we'll be getting targets for this coming year and the work that we're supposed to be doing in terms of moving students forward. So that's kind of the general, all right, this is what the state is telling us that we're doing, and now our job is to um, bring that back to Hopkinton. So when we look at Hopkinton, um, in almost all areas, our schools are doing extraordinarily well. I don't think that's a surprise um, to anyone in this room. Um, you probably didn't have to see the numbers on a piece of paper to know that about um, the Hopkinton Public Schools. So in almost all areas, it's really um, an amazing pleasure to look at the scores for this district and see the results of the great work that's not just being done at school. You know, MCAS is a measure that we um, administer in school, but in many cases, MCAS is a function of student school performance right along with everything that's happening at home. Um, so in most cases, we're meeting or exceeding. Um, as a district, when the state calculated all of those criteria and assigned us all of our zeros and fours and et cetera, um, we earned a score of 87% um, percent towards meeting our target. And when you look at where schools fell across the state of Massachusetts, 87% percent towards meeting our target is um, just about as high as anybody can get right now, or, or as, as high as anybody really is. Um, our high school, as you know, 100% um, of our high school students scored proficient or advanced in ELA. Um, which is, again is a pretty remarkable um, example of the work that's being done there and the caliber of our students. Um, and because of that, because of that amazing achievement, um, our high school is named one of 51 schools of recognition across the state. And um, as Carol pointed out to me, on there's only four high schools in the whole state of Massachusetts that made that esteemed list of 51. So I hope Evan's sitting over. So that's kudos to Mr. Bishop and our, our high school students. Um, and not for nothing, but it really is kudos to everybody because like when you work, live in the elementary school world, we always want to remember it all started down at Center School, um, you know, and they, they worked their way up, but um, that's an amazing recognition for our high school. Um, so in terms of accountability percentages, um, where we are um, with that, um, Elmwood is at 99%, um, Hopkins at 88, the middle school at 93, and the high school at 97. So when we really look at all of those things that the state holds us accountable for, we're right there with everything that they're asking. So um, this little beauty is kind of the breakdown of the areas that um, the state asks us to look at. So over here on the left, you see we're looking again at achievement, just simply how did we score um, growth? How did we do one year compared to the next? High school completion, EL, and the additional indicators of chronic absenteeism and advanced coursework. So over here on the left-hand side, we're looking at students in grades three through eight. Um, and you'll see again the whole, the left hand half of this um, graph is divided into two sections, all of our students and our lowest performing students. So the right hand side is a mirror image except it refers to the high school only. All students at the high school and then our lowest performing. So what happens with the way that we get our um, our percentage towards our target is everything over here um, is examined, all of our students, um, all of these fours and threes are calculated, averaged out, um, and you can see down at the bottom, so for all students um, in grades three to eight, we scored 97% um, percent of our achievement targets. And if we look at our lowest performing students, so that's the lowest 25% of our students, we scored 71% towards the total amount of points towards our target. So the state takes that information, averages it out, um, comes to 84% for grades three to eight. So we've made 84% towards our targets. Now one of the challenges when they kind of put our information together is that our lowest performing students are calculated in twice. They're calculated into kind of this half of the grid where we look at the all student cohort and they're calculated into this half of the grid where we look at our lowest performing students. So it's doubly important, maybe not doubly exactly mathematically, but it's even more important that we look at our student. I mean, this is really the way the state is saying, yeah, you're definitely, we definitely um, are emphasizing the importance of looking at our struggling learners. We already know that here in Hopkinton, um, but it, it, it's another reminder. So. The same kind of thing happens over on the right hand side. We look at, you know, and I mean, certainly there's nothing wrong with looking at a report like this. There's a lot of fours out of four, four out of four, three out of four. Um, we're really, we're, we're doing a nice job. 
So with the high school um, level being at 92% towards achieving our targets, these two numbers, 84 and 92, get averaged together, and that's where we get that 87%. So that's a very high level look at the data. So I don't want you to think that, oh yeah, they just look at this and think, oh yeah, every, everything's good. Um, this is just the global, the big picture of how we're doing grades three through 12 in Hopkinton. So then the state takes this and um, this is just really a way of looking. Um, they divide the, state, the schools into kind of two categories. So we have schools without required assistance or intervention and schools who require it. So it, I don't know, I don't know what you think. I don't know if this kind of categorization is going to be where we're going to end over a period of years. I think this is kind of where we are now and they're not giving us a district accountability level. Um, but at any rate, what we do know is that with Hopkinton being at 87% um, towards our targets, we are meeting our targets based on all the criteria that the state has laid out for us in terms of things that are really important. So this is where we have a breakdown um, where we can really look and see, okay, you know, our third graders, um, and this is the category meeting or exceeding expectations um, that we really like to look at, and, and this is where we like to see our students. So you can see here um, under state where the state averages, and you can see over here on the left-hand side in each column where Hopkinton is. Um, so what we see overall is this is, again, a general um, sense of what we're looking at um, in each grade level. So I'll give you a good example. Um, the seventh grade here, which might stand out, seventh grade English language arts, um, one thing that we learned in one of our trainings with the state is that all of seventh grade in the state went down a little bit in this area. So we have to look at um, what are the trends across the state, um, but more importantly is getting back to our students, who are the students who are behind the numbers and what are we doing to support them. Um, so you can see overall, you know, our scores are strong. We have many, many students who have met or exceeded our expectations on a test that's more rigorous, looking different um, than ever before. So these are our three to eights. These are our high school students. And again, um, with high school, we're looking at proficient or higher um, because that's what, um, that's what the state has given us with the legacy MCAS. So the next piece, the next chapter of this is really, well, now what? So what do we do with all of this information? Um, I'm not going to show you every single um, grid. I could if you wanted to commit, and, and, I'm, and, and I'm happy to, and it's not, but it's, it's a lot. Um, and I think we want to think about what are we looking at, what are we looking for, and, and why. And that's the work that's happening in our schools. So right now we're at the point where, you know, this information just came out. What, what happens with the state is they start, um, little bits of MCAS information start trickling out over the summer and then you have a chance to say, oh, we, we dispute this or dispute that, and the state kind of recalculates certain things. Um, and then finally, just you know, a week or two ago, we got what they called our, our final results. So right now, um, everyone is digging in, looking at the data points, um, looking at the schools overall, looking at the aggregate, and um, absolutely looking at our subgroups. And subgroups could include anything from um, gender, um, ELs, economically disadvantaged, um, race. So there, if you want to look for a subgroup, you name it, they, we can dig in that way. Um, so we obviously want to look at the um, incredible number of reports to look at the standards. So we can look at reports by, um, by student, by standard, and um, this is where schools are saying, oh, look, it looks like we probably didn't get to that topic of um, let's just make this up, area or perimeter, because we can see that only 25% of our students got these answers right. Or look, it looks like um, we didn't score as many points as we would have wanted on such and such an open response question. Let's dig into that and figure out why. And you know, then teachers often have the anecdotal information that they share and that, yep, I expected that to happen. Um, and sometimes you have the opposite where they say, oh my God, we taught that a million times. What, what happened? Um, the state does release some of the questions. Um, you've probably seen many of them, and you can pull up the release questions on the DESE website. Um, you know, there's never enough release that we feel like we can make a whole lot of sense out of it. 
Um, but sometimes you look at the release questions and you realize they did not, it was a language issue. It was the way the question was worded. Um, it, it was something that a teacher will look at and say, I know exactly why they got that wrong, and I'm going to make sure I reemphasize that with my students this year. Um, I think it's really important, um, this data, this um, bullet point right here, um, MCAS is one data point, and I know we talk about that um, all the time. It is a snapshot. It's a very important snapshot. Um, but we know so much information about our students before they even enter the classrooms in September. And that's because of the work that's happened in the previous year, and teachers are collecting information on their students all year long, all the time. And it comes in many different forms. So um, oftentimes the MCAS reinforces, yep, we knew this, we were already worried, or sometimes it provides us with a surprise. And we might say, wow, you know, that student um, performed really well over the course of the year, even on our in-class assessments. Um, so where was the disconnect? And then we go back and we dig and we um, kind of um, perform that, I don't know, like an academic autopsy to figure out what, what happened and why, and where we can make changes appropriately. So the other thing that right now um, teachers and administrators are doing is we really are identifying who are our at-risk learners, who are the students that we're concerned about, and um, what are the plans that we're going to make to provide interventions, provide supports. And a lot of work is done over the first month of school while teachers are establishing routines, they're also establishing um, a lot of benchmarks for the current um, school year. So some of the work, just to provide you with some examples, um, so this was divided, um, this is, looks a little bit um, different from the slideshow that you had in your packet because I broke it out into ELA um, in math. Um, so at Hopkinton Mill School, I think this is a great example of where some of the work had been done previously. So work was done at Hopkins School, there was a group of fifth graders last spring who were identified as potentially continuing to have some challenges. The middle, the middle school principal met with the Hopkins principal and they made a plan, and the plan was to offer a class for sixth graders, um, well, and actually to extend that to seventh and eighth graders as well, um, who really needed some additional foundational work in literacy. Um, and so they've got that up and running. We've got a level um, literacy intervention training for middle school teachers. Um, it's research-based, it's run out of Leslie College, it's one of the best programs that's out there right now for working with struggling readers, and it was something that was lacking at the middle school. And when we look at some of our scores, middle school literacy is an area that we, we want to be working on and we want to improve our performance in that area. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't know that you need me to read through every one of these, but I think you can see that there's a pretty robust um, amount of work that's being done currently. And um, there's nothing about this little box A through G that is fully inclusive. Um, th there's no end here because the work continues over the course of 180 days and then planning for the following year. Um, and then in math, the same kind of thing. Um, we have a lot of new math um, materials and math training at the elementary level. We have a newly developed class for sixth graders at the middle school, again, looking at some at-risk students making that transition to the middle school level. Um, and um, principals are really digging in with ensuring that they are providing time for their faculties to get into this data. Um, make their, sometimes they call them a watch list, the students that we really need to be watchful for um, and make sure that we're tracking their progress over the course of the year. Um, so this is really the work that we're digging into um, over time. Um, and so this is the end of these slides, which you're probably very grateful for, um, but it really, you know, in my estimation, it really is the beginning. You know, we get these scores, we, we um, create our path, and then we move forward. And I think that, you know, the state's point about continuous improvement and really supporting our students who haven't demonstrated that they, they've met those expectations, that's, that's where we have to dig in. So with that, I don't know if I have questions or? That was really well put together. It, yeah. I think you could explain so many of the details of the changes, you. which is hard for people who actually work in the schools to figure out those changes, so that was awesome to see Thank it spelled you. out. That was great. Thank you. It is a work in progress. Yeah, I will. Much so. I think we're all continuing to work on it. <laughs> is it Go ahead. Is there anything that parents, uh, I don't think we've received our MCAS scores yet, so is there anything that parents um, should know when they're looking at this year's report and maybe, I don't, I don't remember now if it shows last year's 
scores for the students or not, but is there anything that's going to look different or maybe that they should be prepared for? Do you know? Have you seen individual? The scores are here. Okay. They should. Have they gone out to the buildings yet? They're not. You, you don't have them yet, but they're. I'm, From what I understand, they'll all be mailed yeah. next Tuesday. Tuesday? Okay. okay. Um, no, I'll be honest with you. I have not. I have not looked at the parent report yet. Um, but I do know there'll be some explanation on it. Um, they, the state has talked about that, so a parent will okay. have some clue of what they're looking at. Um, but I think really what a parent should do is if you open that up and there's anything in it that just doesn't sit right or feel right, um, I would strongly encourage you or anyone else to call the school. We want you to understand um, what it all means. And, it, and, and really, the most important thing is not just what that piece of paper that says MCAS at the top of it means, but what is your child's teacher seeing? And, you, you know, you're all experienced So call parents. The gui their guidance counselor or their teacher, if you're the elementary? Like, who, who is the right MCAS person? At the elementary level, I would recommend calling their classroom teacher. Okay. And I'll defer to Mr. Bishop for who would they call if they have an MCAS question at the high school? Guidance counselor. Okay. a great presentation thank you how much do these MCAS scores guide the administration's thinking when it comes to curriculum I wouldn't say that the MCAS scores guide our curriculum development mm -hmm. um, I guess you could also make the argument that it's all connected because the MCAS is, is really our measure of how we're doing on the mass frameworks which is the curriculum um, but what I will tell you is that um, when we start looking at curriculum development. So we, we um, are tasked with developing a new social studies curriculum this year. And one of the things that we're really going to be looking at when we put that together is how are we supporting different learners? So I think historically when teachers develop curriculum, we don't always ensure that we have enrichment activities and activities that are appropriate for L's or reminders about vocabulary introduction um, or ways to tier a lesson or differentiate some of the reading material. Like social studies is a great example of that because it's so language heavy. So I would say that we look at our areas of weakness um, and we incorporate that when we're looking um, at putting things together. You might be able to speak, I mean, you just came out of that position. Yeah, and I think when we ask the question about how does MCAS guide curriculum decisions, I think, as you've said, it's just one data point because we have BAS testing, we have sort of the LLI progress in uh, at Hopkins, they use the QRI, we continue to use STAR reading, so there are many reading and writing, the SRSD gives us writing benchmarks, so all of those pieces are there that help us on the ELA side and on the math side we still have you know, the STAR math and all of our local assessments and what we've tried to do too is to take some of those assessments and put them into electronic formats because when the kids take the test electronically we want them to have that same experience in class so that the actual format of taking the test doesn't become an inhibitor when they actually do know the math so how do you show what you know in the electronic or on the paper setting I have a few questions. Uh, if you don't mind going to the detailed sheet, which you said, this is where yes. we have all the information. Would you be able to explain in the achievement category, when we look at the high school, why is the weightage um, so much higher uh, on the achievement total? Why is there such a huge discrepancy between the high performers or in the non-high performers. Would you have any idea what's the rationale behind the 47.5 and 67.5? That's huge. Well, that, go okay. ahead. No, it's okay. That's the way the scores are weighted. So that's, so, nope, I'm gonna let you explain that one. <laughs> um, so, now, now I'm not sure if I actually have my answer correct. Um, so where you see the high school completion total, oh, I see why, because you're not getting sort of double credit for a high school completion, that 20% over there. Um, that's because when we're looking at, you know, did we lose the students to dropping out? Did we, you know what I'm saying? So there would only be enough people in that cohort to fall into that, you know, all category, or they would only give you credit for that once. They wouldn't put that same amount of credit over there into your lowest performing students. That's interesting. That is there an assumption that they would not fall in that category? Well, what I think ends up happening is we 
I mean, typically, if we have lose a kid, we maybe one a year. Do you think? Yeah. So, we hardly ever have students who drop out of Hopkinton High School. And the num so just to clear it up to the 47, the 22, that's the waiting. Right, and that's okay. why I'm okay. saying why yeah. is there, you know, you can see the differences, for instance, in the non-high school, that it's 60 to 67.5, mm -hmm. 20 to 22.5, but why is the weight age so different for achievement results? I just thing. wanted to know if you right. had any idea on the so, rationale behind it. And do you it. see how it says 67.5? When you have fifth allegedly you have 50% on the right and 50% on the left mm -hmm. but what ends up happening is you are 50% on the right for lowest performing are also contained in your all students so sort of technically the lowest performing are at 62.5 and the highest performing would be at 38.5 mm -hmm. do you know what I'm saying I'm sorry I didn't quite get that uh. So, but that's okay. Yeah. What they tell you is that this would be 50 and this would be 50% of your score. I see. But your lowest performing, if they are 50% of their whole selves, when you move them also into the all student category, it really sort of takes those kids to their weight would technically be 62.5. Oh, I see. Is that making sense now? Yeah. Some sense. It's, yeah, it's hard to sort of, you know, kind of explain that. That's fine. That's okay. Um, the other question I had uh, was with regard to Hopkins, I mean, I think 88% is pretty good, uh, but compared to, say, Elmwood is at 99%, and, you know, we have the middle school at 93%, high school at 97%. Is there any reason why it's a little lower compared to other schools? I, mean, I think historically, grade four has been one of the more challenging MCAS levels. Um, and Hopkins is home to all of our grade four uh, students. So um, what I will tell you is that you have a Hopkins school principal who is one of the most data-oriented uh, numbers um, interested people that I've ever met. So um, she is aware of you know where their strengths are and that staff has already had a look at those scores. Um, and they're very actively working on identifying patterns, trends in those areas. Um, I still think they did exceedingly well. It does look a smidge lower than the other schools, but I think those have been grade level. I mean, there's, there's always trends in grades, and grade four has just historically seemed to, to be more challenging than grade three. That's um, when they do the long comp still. Well, they don't have the long comp okay. anymore, but it was grade four yeah. when they had it. Um, what they're telling us about these scores is that a, I don't know, like a 529 in grade three should be the same thing as a 529 in grade four, as a 529 in grade five. So it used to be that, you know, if you had done exceedingly well in grade three, you could slip down a little bit because that long comp was so, so tricky for kids. But now that the test has sort of a, a similarity throughout each one of the grade levels, I will say that if you look at and Jen and I have already done some real digging with this. When kids get to Hopkins, I think Vanessa Bolello has done an amazing amount of work with ELA um, testing and scoring that. And I think that her grade five this year is in the top 10 ranked in the state. So that has been a really nice change. And I know that we're working toward the math. Mm -hmm. I think that the concern is probably more around the math in grades four and grade five. I see. Um, one other question I have is more than ELA and math, to me, one of the things that I'd like to see somehow assessed is collaboration among students and the spirit of teamwork. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have these numbers tied, kids are obviously, you know, wanting it's like yourself, right? So you're working on that academic rigor, but I think it's very important to measure collaboration and teamwork and how they're doing working in teams, because in real life, that's what happens. So is there any plan from MCAS, or is there some mechanism we have in place to measure this very difficult thing to measure? I mean, I think the most I can probably say is, you all know that you've heard our district talk about social emotional learning. We've probably talked a, so much about it that people are, might almost be getting tired of hearing about it, although we can't get tired of the concept. But I think in every classroom, teachers are focusing on how can we demonstrate kindness? How can we demonstrate a community? 
um, you know, it's funny, but I heard actually a high school teacher today talking in the, the engineering department, talking about how we can get kids talking to each other more and giving each other feedback um, more often than they have been. So all of those things are being worked on. I mean, 21st century skills tell us that students should be reading, writing, speaking, collaborating, um, working, you know, to your point, in teams. So, you know, we certainly do see that in all of our classrooms. and I. I think there's no easy answer um, to this because the state is never going to give us something about teamwork because you can't measure it with a metric um, the way that, that this kind of thing can. But um, I think that's something that we do struggle with as educators, the importance of balancing just those solid life skills. And that, that is part of college and career readiness. Um, so I know it is something that our teachers focus on, um, but we're not, we're not gonna see it probably in this type of format. And lastly, I want to thank you for putting this together. I'm very excited. Congratulations to both of you for having put together an assistant superintendent's report. Thank Hopefully you. we'll see it as a feature going forward. Thank you. So with that, I think I'll call our student council reps up to The parking out there I know is a little bit crazy tonight. So I'm Emma, I'm a senior. I'm Haley, I'm a freshman. Um, so we have a homework free weekend coming up for Columbus Day, which is always, <laughs> students look forward to it. <laughs> um, and then the spirit week also starts tomorrow because of that long weekend. Um, so seniors have business day. Um, and the freshmen have pajama day. Um, and then, so next week we have pep rally and a Hiller day on Friday. Um, Wednesday is World Mental Health Day, and the clubs will bring awareness for that. And then on October 16th, uh, Mr. Bishop is hosting a principal's coffee um, with parents. And the Science Fair Club will have a pizza and projects day where members of the community can come and see the projects. And then on October 19th is the Be Free Fall Jam. And that's about it for the next two weeks. You guys are busy, though. Busy, yes. <laughs> That's great. Which day is the science fair? Pizza and that is October eighteenth. Is the pizza extended to the? <laughs> <laughs> no. I think we have a meeting that night. So. You you pizza might get more pizza. Extended people. to the community? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Is it here? Because we're going to be here anyway, so we may just need to go on a field trip. That's right. Yeah. Oh, I think so, we did that last year too. Did we? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's do it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll then move into the superintendent's report. Okay, so I was going to talk a little bit about our um, MCAS percentile rankings. I did mention that at Hopkins they had you know, moved their ELA into some of those really high scoring places. Uh, just a, a little shout out to um, the mathematicians at the middle school, grade six was 12th, grade seven was 12th, and grade eight was second, which is really great. And at- in the whole state. In the whole state, that's wow. something, right? And um, at Elmwood, I believe their ELA was fourth and their math was ninth. So we are in some, some very good places this year um, in terms of those rankings. I don't have them for the high school. They haven't given us those for the high school. So the grid that we get is just three to eight. So that was exciting. Um, and then I just wanted to talk a little bit about getting ready for budget season. Um, so just to think a little bit about that as we go into that process. Last year, when we were negotiating with the teachers, and we are going into the budget season with three negotiated contracts. We have completed contract negotiations with teachers, nurses, and parents, so those are sort of some fixed costs. And in FY19, the teachers were sort of, I think, very gracious and amenable at the table. They had said they knew it was a tough budget year and took a 1.25 increase. And so as we go into FY20, we need to remember that we're looking at a 2.25 increase for teacher salaries. Uh, we know that we have taken a look at our capacity and how many students we currently have. And um, given the fact that there are many new homes that will be 
coming to completion before the end of this school year, so before June of 2019. We just need to be aware of the fact that we are probably going to get more students throughout this school year. So far, we have added many positions. You know that you have because we keep coming here and asking for more and more to accommodate the 189 that we've asked for. So my fear is that we you know, may be looking for FY20 to add additional staff and theoretically, because these teachers are not budgeted for, there could be really huge numbers of asks for the next year because we have to take the ones that we already have, carry them over, and then add new personnel in. So that's going to be, I think, a little bit tricky when we think about the numbers of teachers that we'll need to accommodate the needs of the students before us. And then the last thing that I wanted to talk about was just sort of our building capacity. We, Susan and I, had reached out to some of the principals and just asked them a little bit about capacity. And Ann Carver had shared that at Elmwood School there would be two classrooms we could free up. Um, and we could free them up if we decided to put the health teacher on a cart and the art teacher on a cart. So those would be our last two classrooms there. Uh, Nancy and I um, met with Mr. Kamalo and the Board of Selectmen Chair, uh, Mrs. Wright, and we had talked about how the current first grade class is actually smaller than the outgoing third grade class, which buys us a little bit of time at Elmwood. But as we all know, with the 60 additional students, that kindergarten class at Elmwood, uh, the marathon is huge. So I would say that we're in that 24 month kind of looking at what we could do with Elmwood. And with Hopkins, that's another place where there are external classrooms and internal classrooms. Currently, there are a couple of internal classrooms that we could free up. There's one that they are using for ELA and math remediation. There's one that is used for a science lab. And then if push came to shove, and this would not be very pleasant in, in that building, but they could probably do sort of music on a cart if they needed to do that. Um, at the middle school, I know that uh, Mrs. Rothermick is still in conversation with Mr. Keller because um, there is some classroom space that may need to be reconfigured. So we're kind of working on that, but that might require like small construction projects, you're thinking. And in talking to Mr. Bishop, one of the things that we have learned is that typically during any one of the seven periods of the day, there is typically only one or two free classrooms spaces in this building. So. Um, classroom space is a concern, and we are taking that very seriously as we start to move into budget season. So student growth, classrooms, and um, fixed costs around you know, teacher raises. And in addition to that, one thing I, I should probably add is, in addition to the 2.25 that we know will be the, that cost of living increase, some of our teachers will have step raises because they're not on the top step of the salary schedule, and some of them will earn different degrees or move over to master's plus 15, master's plus 30. So we have to think about those lane changes as well as we go. And I think that that is all I have to say about moving into budget season. Full of cheer and Doesn't goodwill. Doesn't feel cheery. <laughs> no. Uh, so that moves us into the school committee chair report. And I just have, I have approved for a payment. The accounts payable warrants 19-020, 19-021, 19-022, 19-023, 19-024, 19-025, 19-026, 19-027, 19-028, 19-029, 19-029, 19-030, 19-031, 19-032, 19-033, 19-034, 19-035, 19-036, 19-037, 19-038, 19-039, 19-040, 19-041, 19-042, 19-043, 19-044, 19-045, 19-046, 19-047, 19-048, 19-049, 19-050, 19-051, 19-052, 19-053, 19-054, 19-055, 19-056, 19-057, 19-058, 19-059, 19-060, 19-061, 19-062, 19-067, 19-068, 19-069, 19-070, 19-071, 19-072, 19-073, 19-074, 19-075, 19-076, 19-077, 19-078, 19-079, 19-078, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079, 19-079
and there was just one concern brought up at this meeting. Um, they said it was traffic was is actually pretty good, um, but they were concerned about um, the turn coming from Milford and how they're the building the the turn into the driveway kind of sneaks up on you. There's a sign, but then all of a sudden, boom! It's 25 miles an hour from 40, and you got to so um, there's a lot of conversation about that. But the long and the short said basically the rules are 300 feet things are set at 300 feet they're the way they need to be um so i don't know if you, anyone has heard any other feedback about that but that that was one of the big conversations was coming from milford getting into the parking lot um can be um a little surprising i guess but everything's pretty good um and then the other liaison report that i wanted to give was um the um again we're still talking of center school reuse, and it's over, I know, but the report was given at the Board of Selectmen's meeting. Um, they accepted the report, and they actually kept our, um, our committee together, I guess, for a little while longer to see if anything else pops up. But, um, but I think it was well-received, and it went well, and that report's available, I, I believe, on the, in the Selectmen's um, agenda. So, yep, that's it. Great. I have a couple of updates. Um, we met as part of the Community Communications Subcommittee, uh, but we chose um, that instead of making it a subcommittee, we should probably be a group, if you will, of uh, willing members from the community, school and town uh, departments, as well as various town organizations. And the chart, uh, you know, the charter is more to foster collaboration and open communication. And if there are any issues, to bring it up and see how we can resolve it. And each department or uh, whichever is the organization would take that material back, think about it, and bring it back. Um, one of the things that was brought up was, you know, how the mass communication that's sent out from schools, is there a possibility to make it a little bit better? So these are some of the things that we will be looking to tackle. Um, and Dr. Kavanaugh actually was very kind and offered to join the leadership meeting with the town officials. This was something that Connor Deegan, our town clerk, had uh, suggested. So that was great. Uh, I think that's something we wanted, closer working uh, relationship between the town as well as the schools. Um, so that was great. And uh, there was some conversation about possibly school uh, members, administration members joining uh, the holiday party that the town hosts. They were not so open about school committee members joining. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other update I have is on the tech front. Um, I think I mentioned this uh, last time around that I'm interested in joining the innovation subcommittee that's being formed there. Um, so Eric Erickson, um, who is the director, who's one of the directors who manages uh, programming and professional development, he um, has offered to arrange some speakers to bring awareness in various areas. So I'd be looking to work with Dr. Kavanaugh and uh, Ms. Parsons and see what are the areas that we could possibly look to bring here. The last one is on the planning board. Um, we had a meeting, Dr. Kavanaugh, Ms. Parson, and I met with uh, the planning board chair, Muriel Kramer, and also the super knowledgeable planning board member, Amy Ritterbush. She knows it all somehow. Um, and um, so it was more to talk about growth and how do we plan and how can we work closer with planning board. Um, so a suggestion that Ms. Kramer uh, brought up was to create a task force of invested citizens that can look to the impact of growth in schools, town infrastructure, and in general create a strategic plan of sorts. And perhaps each department that joins there looks for innovative ideas and plans ahead. Right? She talked about something of this nature having been done several years ago. Um, so more to come on this. There were some names that were thrown out, so uh, it's still in the works. So those are the updates. Do you guys have any down there? I just have a quick update on the website subcommittee. Tomorrow, a survey is going out to the community, um, including staff, high school students, and um, parents. And the link is available to community members as well, um, seeking input, gathering input on experience with our 
current website and thoughts about our future website. Um, so that's a first step in our requirements gathering. We have also um, scheduled two, we've just scheduled and we'll be announcing two public uh, forums, workshops, where community members can come together with uh, members of the um, subcommittee to um, sort of dig deep into what the website can and should do for us. And one of them will be on Saturday, October 20th in the morning from 10 to 1130 um, right here in the high school library. And the other one, we picked one, one weekend and one evening. So the other one is a Tuesday, October 23rd from I think 630 to 8. Uh, again here in the library and those will be published um, for anyone who's interested we also have a um, page under the school committee um, website where we have our meetings posted the members are listed contact information etc so that's great Thank you. all right then uh, with that uh, do you want to move out of order or do you want to go directly into your stuff oh no we can have mr. Bishop come up sure would you like to come up mr. Bishop and Hello, everyone. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you making time for the high school requests on your agenda this evening. Absolutely. Um, we are a little over a month into the school year, and it's been a wonderful yeah. start at the high school. So as always, I want to thank you for your support. So um, I am here tonight to uh, request some increases to staffing at the high school. Uh, I'll categorize them as uh, some operational increases, but also some increases based on the enrollment that we're seeing at the high school that we talked about earlier that affect our students and our staff. So I'll start with the operational one first, which is the campus aid position. So we are requesting uh, an increase of a 1.0 campus aid position. Uh, you may remember uh, last year, unfortunately, we were uh, forced to cut our 10-month guidance secretary position. And at a school of almost 1,200 students, um, that is a little bit rare to only have one support person on our guidance department. So um, it was a difficult cut for us, uh, but what we did was we brought groups from the main office, our support staff, our, our guidance support staff, and our campus aide who was out at the front booth when you check into the high school. We brought us together at the end of the year to talk a little bit about how we can manage the flow of these different areas with one less person. And we came up with a plan where we'd take our current campus aide, who I said is in the front booth, we would work there half the day, and then the second half of the day would then go into the guidance department and help with that flow of students there. While that position would go into the guidance department, we sent one of our main office administrative assistants out to the booth and leaving only one person in the main office. And what we're finding is that we're not able to effectively manage the guidance department in the morning as well as the main office in the afternoon. And we have a revolving door of people working at the front booth, which talking to Office of Powers and the police department, it's critical to have a consistent person at your security booth. Uh, we've uh, thrown out the idea of maybe bringing in parent volunteers to assist us at the booth. Um, we've made uh, st uh, statements at back to school night. We've sent out letters to parents at the beginning of the year. We've had a few people volunteer, but not on a consistent enough basis. Um, and there's probably some concerns that we could discuss about having uh, volunteers in that booth to begin with. So um, right now it's just things are falling through the cracks at a rate that I'm not comfortable with. And, and we're not being able to offer the services, in my opinion, in those areas like we've done in the past. So uh, I feel if we were to bring on an additional campus aid position, we'd be able to have someone both in the guidance office to help with that support, but also have a consistent person in our booth. And then our main office would be able to function with the two people that we have. We have a third person in the main office, but that's only for half the day. They're also our special education uh, administrative assistant. So at the, the lunchtime, that person goes upstairs to our special education offices. So we have a lot of moving parts to begin with, but without one person in the fold, we tried to, to make it work, and we're one month in, like I said, and it's not working. Uh, like I said, this filing that needs to be done, um, we've had some SAT and pre-SAT paperwork that has been out in the past much earlier than it's been out this year. Phone calls are not being answered at the rate that I would uh, uh, expect. Uh, we've had a few parents come in and say that I've waited quite a bit of time to, to, just to talk to someone to set up an appointment. And that's not the, the customer service that I feel like is, is appropriate at the high school. So that's the basis of the request. I'm happy to answer any questions you have about the position, about the roles, about some of the other things that we try to do to make this work um, before I um, go into the, the staffing increases that we're looking to add. I have a comment. I'm, I'm super impressed that you have looked at all of these alternates 
before coming to us requesting this. So thank you for being cognizant of where we are uh, financially as a district. So thank you. I support this. Yeah, you answered all the questions I had. <laughs> so if there are no more questions, I, I would seek a motion on this position right here to approve a 1.0 campus aid position at the high school before we move into the other. So moved. Motion by Mina, second. Second. By Jen. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So approved. Thank and you very much. I, I appreciate the support. Like, I, I, I know that our, our front office staff, our guidance staff, will be, <coughs> our guidance department, and, and, and everybody will be very pleased with this. So thank you very much. We appreciate it. So the, the next um, staffing increases that, that, that I'm requesting here this evening is a 1.6 increase uh, to our overall staffing. Um, and this is directly related to the increased enrollment that we're seeing at the high school and really across the district, as you know, and it directly affects our students and our staff, which is our most important uh, people in the building, right? Um, we had 72 new students transfer into the high school this summer uh, that were not expected. Um, and uh, we had 26 students transfer out, so that's a net increase of about 46 students that we're, we're not planning for during the budget process. Um, we had a larger senior class that just graduated, then we have an incoming ninth grade class or current ninth grade class. So overall, there's 29 new students and 26 over projection, which, if you think about it, doesn't seem like that many more students. However, again, unfortunately, we had to cut 1.6 staffing last year through the budget process. So it's really feeling like more like 55 to 60 students that were not accounted for. And we're having certain departments more than others are feeling this, uh, um, these large class sizes. I have been feeling numerous phone calls and emails from parents from the beginning of the school year all the way up to just today. Concerns about how big some of these classes are. So I just want to kind of walk through uh, some of the averages and, and some data that I have here for you and answer any questions that you have. Again, our, our total enrollment right now is at 1188, which is the largest school that we've, that we've had. And looking at projections to next year, not to talk about next year's budget cycle, but we'll be over 1,200 students. And so that will be the largest uh, school that we've had here in Hopkinton. So the three departments that I feel are being I hit the most in terms of their enrollment is the history department, the science department, and our math department. Uh, not to say our English department and some of our wellness classes aren't large, but those are the three when we're trying to be fiscally responsible here to ask for that 1.6 at the middle of the year, which I'll explain in a second why we're asking for it in January. Um, those are the departments we have in our AP and honors history classes. The class averages are 26.5. We have 28 classes right now, first semester, over 24, and two that are over 30. Um, and each teacher in the history department on average has about 123 students on their caseload. In our math department, our AP and honors classes, we have class sizes of 25.5. We have 23 classes over 24 and two classes over 30. Um, and their average student load is about 111. In our science department, we usually try to cap the classes at 24 with a lab-based science and, and OSHA expectations to try to have smaller classes for, for the hands-on activities. Every one of our senior level college prep classes is over 25 students this year. Um, and the average course load for a science teacher is 92, but most only teach four classes with labs. So that average is really like 115 students if they had a fifth class. So those numbers are really high. Um, within the history department, eight different types of classes have an average of over 25. And our AP US History 1 class is an average of 28.8 students in the three sections. Our Honors U.S. History and Government 2 is an average of 28.5 in our five sections that we have. So if that's the average, you have to, there's some that are 20, 29 and 30 across the board. Our AP Psych averages are around uh, 27.6. Our Intro to Economics College Prep class is 28.5. Um, and our Honors Economics class is average at 29 kids in our two sections. So those are really high class numbers in those departments. So of the 1.6 that we're asking for, I think 1.0 needs to be get dedicated to our history department. Um, kids often take two, sometimes three history classes when they're juniors and seniors because they're very popular electives from AP Psych to AP Government, and those classes are the ones that are feeling like they are, uh, are over, over maxed. Um, like I said, with the science department, our college prep senior level class, anatomy and physiology, uh, human impacts on the earth and earth science, those classes are higher than they've ever been. They, we try to cap at 24. I just spoke to one of our teachers in one of those classes. We just put a 28th kid in there today with some movements around with schedules. So of the 1.6 requests, we're hoping to have just 0.2 in our science department to add another senior level elective second semester to relieve some of those numbers. So we'll be able to move kids around. So 
the way it works at the high school, and I'm sure many of you know, we have semesterization. So first semester, we have our classes already scheduled, and these are where some of these numbers are coming from. And then when second semester starts, we, we kind of shuffle the whole schedule around. So the ask would, do we need it right now? Yes. Do I think we can manage between now and January? I think we can. But come January, when the semester changes over, if we're able to add these teachers, we'll be able to bring a lot of these class sizes down. Bringing a teacher right now to a class of 30 and just splitting the class, to me, is not a reasonable thing to do. Who gets the new teacher? Who stays with the old teacher? It's not the best practice for students. So I've had many meetings with our staff about, you know, we, we, we hear you. We know the numbers are high. We're working together to see what we can do to, to make it the best learning environment for our teachers. And so they've been really good sports. I went into a, I met with a math teacher this afternoon uh, after school, and there must have been 46 kids in the, in the room getting extra help. And I think that happens when you have these large classes at the high school where you're not able to kind of have that one-to-one -one interaction as much as you can with a smaller class. And, and the turnaround of assessments and grades is not to where the teachers want it to be, and I'm sure where the students want it to be. And oftentimes kids will participate more in smaller classes. It's tougher in a skill-based class when you have large class sizes. So there's a lot of things that are in play that I think that the teachers are doing a wonderful job and the, and the students are as well. But I find it's my responsibility to try to make sure that we, we create the best environment for them. And so again, that's, that's really why I'm here. And then math, uh, we have six classes of an average of over 25. And our honors algebra one is an average of 29.5 in our three sections, and honors geometry is also 29.5. Those are the two sections that have 30 and 31 students in it. We are shuffling desks from one room to the other at times, and so um, the, the enrollment that we're seeing is just coming at us at a pretty alarming rate, and I feel like we would have been keeping up with it uh, the best that we can. We've been trying to be appropriate when we ask for staffing each and every year, but obviously last year was a very difficult year, and, and so that kind of set us back a little bit, and then you still have more kids coming in. And so I think if we're able to add those, that the 1.6 FTE will be able to target right now the history, science, and math numbers and bring those down. And I think, like I mentioned before, our eighth grade is much larger than our senior class currently, so the numbers will go up again. And then we'll be talking about what we need to address when it comes to that. But we have built in some extra staffing in English, you know, ahead of time. So that's not a department right now I think we need to look into until maybe next the, the FY20 budget cycle. I think right now those are the three departments that we're trying to focus on. So I know I threw a lot of information at you right there, a lot of numbers, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about how the schedule works, maybe why some of these classes are like this, you know, uh, what it's like to have large classes at the high school, whatever questions you may have, I'm, I'm happy to, to answer them. I have a question. Yes. Um, you know, we invest quite heavily in technology across the district. Um, and I, for one, learn a lot through what is out there, you know, with where technology is today. Have you considered blended learning as a model? Has that been piloted, or is there any plan around that? Can you share your thoughts yeah, on so that, Yeah, so we've had, we've had a blended learning environment in some of our classes and some of our departments probably for about four or five years now. Yeah, uh, for example, we have uh, in virtual classes as well. So we have our forensics class, oftentimes they'll meet in the classroom for three of their five periods, and the two will be virtual kind of blended opportunities. A lot of our elective classes have some blended opportunities, whether it be in our photo classes. Uh, I know what someone mentioned, uh, well, it's on the agenda coming up, our BPA and our robotics, a lot of that can be blended learning environments as well. So it's something that we don't have across the board, but some departments and teachers are more comfortable with it than others. Um, but I can tell you there's probably our multicultural literature, uh, literature class has a virtual blended component to it. So I'd say there's probably one or two classes per department that's already kind of going in that direction. I see. Is there something uh, along those lines for history? Um, if I, uh, our economics class that is kind of a history but also kind of a business technology class, it kind of floats in two different departments here at the high school, um, their teacher, that teacher of that class is, is, is exploring some options. But I'd say across the board right now we don't have a uh, virtual or blended opportunity necessarily in that department as, as it's currently constituted. Not yet. Not yet. I have one question more for Ms. Rothermick here. Um, so we have been receiving these requests, right, for uh, more staff, which are clearly needed. We don't want class sizes to be so high. What is the source of the funding here? Wh which pool are we taking this money from and putting in where it's much needed, clearly? But then are we sacrificing something else there? So I just wanted to know the source of funding here. So right now, I think at this time, um, the prepaid transportation would be um, part of the source of this funding. The other piece that I'll be able to examine now is 
teachers have until October 1 for their lane changes. Um, so at this point, that deadline has passed, so I'll be able to look at who had put in an intent and who did not achieve that lane change. So we may gain some, some money through that as well. I'll be able to true that up. Okay. Um, do you foresee, I remember last year at some point we had the freeze, mm -hmm. right? Um, do you foresee us having a smooth budget year to the end? Are we in a good shape? What's your assessment? Well, um, yeah, I mean, you never know. Uh, I know that there are still some special education placement changes going on, so that's something that we'll have to keep an eye on. Um, the, de the, the upside to that is there was a correction to the circuit breaker reimbursement, so that gave us a little bit more money at the end of last fiscal year. So we may have a, you know, a little bit of cushion in the circuit breaker if, if um, the trend for um, you know, student need in, in special education does not go favorably. So you know, there'll be that that we can look at as well. You will raise the red alert sooner rather than later, right? Right. I mean, so when you look at last year in terms, you know, we had um, money that we could use to prepay, and a majority of that came from unpaid salaries, if you will. Mm -hmm. So teachers go out on a long-term leave that's unanticipated. That's not something you can budget for, and it's not something that I know now. So those are the things that happen as the year goes on that you just keep your eye on. So they run out of sick time, they run out of their FMLA leave time, and they're on unpaid status, and you're paying a sub at a much lower rate. Um, you know, so that, that's another place, but that's something that you literally have to watch right till the end of the year. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, well, I, I will say that the enrollment issues that we have had have been um, uniquely challenging across the district, and I, 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 again, I commend how you've gone in and looked really creatively at where the, to target them for next semester. So if there are um, I, no other questions, I would seek a motion to approve the 1.6 FTE for the high school starting in mid-January of 2019. So moved. Second? Se second. Okay, motion by Meg, second by Jen. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And that is approved. So thank, thank you. you so and much, thank and thank you for your support. You. We, we really Absolutely. appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hearing from students makes me start to sweat a little bit over here. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's, 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 it's a lot. Job. It's just on the, your open house night, just look at, looking at the number of parents going through the halls. Is, yeah. Yeah. Or out into the halls repeated. trying to yeah. kind of listen to what was going on. Yeah, it's and 190 lab reports to look at and give good feedback on. And history of sweating savings. again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's yeah. it. It has to be done. Yeah, and I can't speak enough about how great the staff has been and how, awesome. how much they have continued to work as hard as they can and not complain. And, and, and we have a wonderful staff. You know, wonderful students and a supportive community and a supportive school committee. So appreciate all the hard work on yeah. the staff and admin. Absolutely. Parts. Thank, you. Thank you. Congrats on your MCAS school. Yes. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. It really is. Yeah, it's uh, like I said, the, 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 the kids are wonderful. Um, you know, it's I brought this up to the staff the other day at our staff meeting, and I said we don't measure ourselves on statistics. We measure ourselves on a lot of different things: building relationships with the kids, the environment, the culture that we create. But it is nice when you see how great the kids are doing when it comes to st st you know, statistical measures like this. So it was great to see. And so I know that the, the staff was really proud of themselves, and, and rightfully so. They did a great job. It was also, on an unrelated note, the National Honor Society and the, the National Honors Art Society was a really nice addition to see the, the Art Society moved in. But that's nice. always nice to see how well our students are doing. Yeah, so. it's, it's wonderful. It's a, it's a, it was a wonderful night. That's really run by the students. I know our advisor, Ms. Williams, does a great job, but she kind of steps back and lets the students run it, and they pick the, the staff speaker, they give the speeches, they set up all the logistics, and so it's a really, it's a wonderful night. I look forward to it every year. And it was I'm, a great addition with the Art um, the National Art Society as well. I think agree. Nice I love touch. listening to the students speak, too. Yeah, so. yeah they're very always, talented. Yeah. Always a highlight. And there were numerous kids who qualified for both, for both. societies. There were numerous yes. kids that qualified that for both, nice. which is just incredible. Yeah. And the other thing, they cleaned up. So did they did. Yes, they I mean, did. They yes. There were kids in there pushing they did. rooms, they did. and that was really, really impressive. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yep. Good kids. It's a great group. Yeah, absolutely.
Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you so much. Have a good night. You too. Thank you. So that, that, that will bring us back to the beginning of new business with item A, with the High School Business Professionals of America National Leadership Conference. Okay. So I am presenting this on behalf of Mr. Scott, who is our subject matter leader for business technology, computer science, robotics. He does it all from 6 to 12. Uh, he would like permission to take the business professionals of America to their national leadership con conference. That is in the first weekend of May, May 1st to May 5th, and it's in Anaheim, California. Um, what he lets us know is that uh, there should be about 6,000 students there from around the country, and um, kids have this opportunity to attend leadership workshops and compete with each other. Um, they can compete in teams individually, so it is a pretty amazing experience. He is very devoted. He is yeah, most puts assuredly. a lot into all of these different programs that he's involved in. I, I have to say, Anaheim in May sounds really lovely. To, I didn't see the part where he's looking for a school committee member. <laughs> Additional chaperones welcome, it says. <laughs> um, this is the crew that comes back and presents to us, I think, right, in the spring. Did we see them last year? Yeah, it's fantastic. They, 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 they did a great job. Yeah. Yeah. So that's great. Great they're going back. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Any? I just want to say I had a chance to, t to talk to Mr. Scott today um, about the work that he's doing, and um, it's so exciting. Yeah. These are great programs, and um, he was saying how the students who participate, um, for them, you know, for many of them, this is their sport. Right. You know, or this is their this is their sort of home Passion. in the school, yeah. and um, they get so many amazing life skills out of this. Um, my one concern was about the fact that this trip abuts um, the start of AP testing. So the there are two weeks of AP testing, um, but again, of course, Mr. Scott was four steps ahead of my concerns because he said they have a um, close relationship with the guidance office, and they. Um, identify very early any students who may need an alternate date for testing. So, um, you know, it, they, they've started talking about the schedule. They started in September, and the students have been thinking about where their tests fall, and they've been working with Mrs. Greco in guidance. So um, it seems that that is not an issue. So sharing that. Thank you. It's good that you caught that. Got the AP schedule right here. <laughs> I do. They, All right. If there are no more questions, then I would uh, seek a motion to approve the Hopkinton High School students' overnight travel for the National Leadership Conference May 1st through 5th, 2019 in Anaheim, California. So moved. Second. Motion by Meg, second by Amanda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And so that is so passed, and that moves us into the high school robotics. Yes. So again, Mr. Scott is seeking a permission to take his high school uh, robotics team, the high, Hopkinton High School Hopkinetics students, to attend the World <laughs> Tournament in good. Louisville, Kentucky, and that is April 24th to April 27th. Uh, he lets us know that not only will the kids um, put to use their newly acquired engineering skills, but there's also an awful lot of documentation and communication that they have to um, put forth as the judges interact with them. So they document the different kinds of changes that they've made, and they have to sort of articulate as a team you know, how it came to be that they ended up with this particular robot and, and what it does. So I think it's an incredible opportunity for our kids to take part in that. I had visited the robotics classroom several times last year, and it always amazes me to watch them. I mean, we talk about collaboration. That's a place where the kids are testing and correcting and going back and redesigning, and it's really an amazing thing. Any questions, comments? It's so amazing. Isn't it? It is. It really, mm -hmm. it is amazing. We are very fortunate. So I guess I would seek a motion then to approve the Hopkinton High School overnight travel for Robotics Worlds Tournament in Louisville, Kentucky from April 24th through the 27th, 2019. So moved, but it's pronounced Louisville. <laughs> well, how is it pronounced? Louisville. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> okay. I'll practice on the ride home. <laughs> <laughs> Louisville. Oh. I'll second. Is there a that. second? You second. Uh, so motion by Meg, second by Amanda. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So that also passes. And that brings us to the middle school robotics yeah. world's tournament. Uh, okay. This is also in. Louisville. <laughs> um, so the Middle School Robotics World Tournament, uh, they would be going from April 28th to April 30th, and um, 
the name of their team is the Hopkinton Middle School Robo Hillers. They would like your permission to attend that conference. It, it is awesome that there's such a, a program exists in the middle school. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any questions? It's not the same day. No, it's different days. It's huh? it back to back. Yes. Oh, it is the same dates. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. So it's, no, 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 it's back to back. It goes the 24th to the 27th and then the 28th to the 30th. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm I've, I've heard the same things that Amanda talked about that for some of these kids, this is their sport. Yes. yes. And it means the world to them. Right. So, yep. good job. Good luck. Enjoy okay. yourself. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and that's Derby Week in Louisville. Okay. Oh, wow. I'm not even getting there <laughs> to try saying so, it. So, in, <laughs> in that case, I would seek a motion to approve the Hopkinton Middle School overnight travel for Robotics World's Tournament in Louisville, Kentucky <laughs> from April 28th to 30th, 2019. So moved. Oh, sorry. Meg is on a roll. You go. So moved. Motion by Meg and a second? Second. By Amina. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And it also carries, and, and was that better on the pronunciation there? It was much better, thank you. <laughs> she didn't get passing grade <laughs> yet. <laughs> no, I just want, I, maybe I'm up to a C. So so I just so want to really so thank Mr. Scott again, if you could just yeah. pass on, um, for taking the time to talk with me today, but also just the amazing amount of work that he has done. And most of these programs I think he brought, he identified yes. from his life in general and brought them to us and we have done nothing but benefit from he, them. Yes. So. He's a huge asset. Yeah. yeah. And to his both. energy is tireless, yeah. really. It, that's yeah. exactly. Yeah. So that moves us into uh, school committee policy, BCA school committee member ethics for a first reading. Yes. So this is a first reading because this is a brand new policy for us. So we have never had this policy before and the one that you see in your packet is sort of directly taken from the MASC um, policy BCA and this is the one that deals with school committee member ethics. So, and I think this sort of came to us because as we started to meet in the summer we thought it might be nice to have a policy like this. I think I, I also think Meg had made a request mm -hmm. when we first reorganized that in looking through stuff. So I don't I did not receive any comments on this from the public. Did any received in central either. office? No. Okay. I have some thoughts, if I may. I, I think it's Jump exciting in. that we're doing this, calling this out. Right? Yes. Um, I saw that word um, Playing politics, right? That Where are you, Mina? Am I looking in the right place? Yeah, it's number, number six. six. Yep. Right. Okay. So, yep. in the community. Right. I felt we need to elaborate that um, a little bit. What would that mean? I have a personal take. <laughs> I mean, did you did you have a take on No, I was just thinking that rather than just having a general category of, and you know, the word politics seems to have taken a very bad, you know, it's gotten a bad reputation. Mm. Um, but it is, it involves people and wherever there are people, there are politics. So when we say playing politics, are there some things that we don't want to happen, I feel like we should call that out, rather than just saying playing politics as a, you know, it's not well defined. Do you think it's defined by the last phrase to benefit personally from their committee activities? Is that it? In some. I think they're of, course, uh, of course, of mm course. -hmm. I think it, it is part of it, but is that it is? I took it as, is, in it is those being two additional things that the, and, and I don't know, this is my interpretation, but the not benefiting personally being one thing I think of as personal benefits being that you're not, you know, advocating for something that benefits your family or your child or you personally in mm. the community or in the school in some way. Mm. But I think of the 
political piece, it, it, I guess, could also be a type of personal thing that if you're playing politics, so to speak, that you're playing to not necessarily the best interest of the school, but for your own political gain. And that when I'm looking down there, I don't mean you personally. It just happens to be the way I'm looking. <laughs> I'm not looking at you. No, so I'm, clearly I'm saying it's <laughs> <me. laughs> I was looking at Amanda because she's head on, but uh, I was not implying anything. By Thank you. Right, right. Uh, but I don't, I, I don't know if y you guys had any discussion about that in particular that would help I mean, clarify if, that. If we had something about having a, um, a personal agenda in some sense, um, as opposed to being unselfish and making sure that our, I don't know how we could phrase it, but um, we'd have to work on the wording, but something along those lines, you know, should, there shouldn't be a hidden agenda. You should be in it for the benefit of the school community as part and of the larger community. I think yeah. you have all of that wording, but I just felt if, we, if there is something specific that we want to say about playing politics, we should spell it out because it's ambiguous. Everybody has their own interpretation of it. Right. And Maybe that's why it says in any sense of the word. <laughs> <laughs> so well, whatever you decide. Whatever it is. Right. Well, no, it, it's point. not just for the sake of being reelected. Um, as prestigious as people may feel that having 10 terms in the school oh, committee yes. might be. Um, okay. 20 years. 20, yeah. wait, there you go. It's a stepping stone so so that, was, that was one thought where I felt like maybe either we get rid of it or, you know, because there's a lot of explanation otherwise, right? Or if there is something specific, we should simply elaborate it. Um, the other one I had was on the second page, I think there's a typo in the first line that they alone cannot yeah, buy so the committee. It should right? be alone and not alone. Right? Yeah. yeah. So. Oh, right. Good call. We should tell the MSC. Otherwise, it looked like, you know, uh, very good things that you have brought forth here. I think this, along with the norms that we have in place, I, I think it's pretty good ground. Right. So great job, ladies. Should we eliminate that sentence completely, maybe, and say um, unselfish service um, with no intent to benefit personally from their committee activities? Yes. Yeah, and sure. just eliminate the part that isn't sort of hazy, ambiguous? I think that works Amen. for me. I like that. I like, I like that. that. Yeah. I mean, I understand Nancy's point is in that they are. They can be. Like, there is that pursuing a personal agenda, which isn't necessarily the same as benefiting yourself and your immediate family personally. Necess necessarily, they could be the same, or they may right. not be the same. Um, but I'm fine with either striking that, like you said, or changing the words "play politics" to um, with no intent to pursue a personal agenda or benefit personally. I'd go with either one of I those. I like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's good too. I thought for some reason that maybe there was something about personal gain. No? Am I imagining? Benefit person, not necessarily. Okay, it, it does say in number six further down, right? Right, or, or to benefit personally. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So leave it to you ladies too. Okay, we can play with number six. Yeah. And bring it back. Okay. Any other? Comments on that? We want to. Um, that's an easy fix if that's all you got. <laughs> Make it, how do you feel? Do, do you because you originally had the um, the vision of the need, which I think was a good a good one. Uh, no, I, I think this is great. I think it, it spells out what I just wanted to be made a little more explicit about where our responsibilities mm -hmm. lie mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. Not just an annual updating of norms, but this sure. is why we're here. Mm -hmm. These are the main reasons. Yeah. Very good. So thank you for digging that out. We've made very minor changes. Um, but do we want to bring this back for a second reading, or do we feel like we're ready to go ahead with? I'm ready to go ahead. As amended? As so amended. Saying? Okay. Yeah. As long as we have the... Uh, have we amended? So what would the wording just, of number six be? No, that's fair. Would it, what would the wording of number six be then? Accept the office as a committee member as a means of unselfish surface service with no personal agenda? Um, Intent to To further pursue, a personal agenda? Yeah. Okay. It, 
or benefit personally? Yeah. I, I don't know, I have some discomfort with the word uh, unselfish, but if everyone's okay, and especially if, uh, Meg, what are your thoughts? I'm sorry, I'm just singling you out here, but anybody else too? Well, what is your problem with unselfish? What is your problem with unselfish? Um, I think we are all invested in this, right? So I do think that there is the self in it. So to me, calling it unselfish, I don't know. That, that's my discomfort. I want the schools to do well. I care for it. I'm invested in it. But that's different than I think the selfish gain would be the, the unselfish piece is that you're looking at the greater good in the school. You're not wanting you yourself mm. to do. I don't, maybe we should bring it back. Do you want to think about it a little bit? I don't want to push it through if we have, it, that, that'll give us all some time to think on it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's good. That's a good point. So I think yeah. we should bring I, it back. Thank you. Is it okay with you, Mina? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And we will bring that back um, for a second reading at the next, and that we can all kind of think on those points. And okay. So we have a second new policy. Um, this is policy BGE, and it is a policy that will talk about how policies are disseminated. Um, and once again, this is a uh, policy that came right from MASC. And we talked about this one because we really don't at this point have sort of that organized hard copy in the central office and we feel like we need to have one there so that um, in the event that somebody would like to come and take a look at those policies in hard copy they would have them um, but we always have them on our website where they are in fact updated so um, this just sort of codifies on, on paper how that will look I have one comment on it I felt that the timeline for policy dissemination um, should be provided. And we probably should think about keeping up with the times and sharing it via social media somehow. So those are things that come to mind. What do you have in mind when you say social media? Um, I know that we have a Facebook uh, page, right? Mm -hmm. And I know we also have Twitter accounts. Uh, the schools have Twitter accounts. So maybe try to reach as many people through various means. People do sign up to Facebook. You know, they uh, sign up to the Twitter. I don't know what the right word is for Twitter about signing up, but you know what I mean. So look to broaden and uh, in terms of dissemination. And I, fe I think one feedback we had received was just knowing a little bit about what is this policy about. Sometimes it just says BJI and doesn't give a little detail. If we had that little detail, that'll help. Not that the policy will guide that level of detail, mm -hmm. but something to think about that when we are sending that information, we give enough time, we give enough detail that people have had a chance to look at it they are if you say BJI that is not going to catch anybody's eyes who are working you know wherever with work life whatever so I think if we give a little bit of description it will help people perhaps they'll be more in you know interested in clicking it's my hope do you think the title would do that for us? I think the title is a great start. Usually I've found that most of our policies titles are uh, pretty self-explanatory, right? So, so when, just for a clarification, when you're talking about moving to a, like Twitter into social media and, and whatnot, do you mean for policies as we're reviewing them or do you mean for the, the policy um, like com compilation well, that we're talking about here. No, I think um, where it is housed is our website, right? right. But I think yeah. when we are disseminating that there is going to be a change or what have you, it should happen through all available means of communication yes. and keeping up with the times. And I think we should define the timeline, like how much in advance 
should we let folks know that this is changing, right? We should define that in the policies, my hope. We can give a range. So we, we let folks know about a policy change two weeks or that a policy reading is coming up for, and we need your feedback a week or two. I don't know what's the reasonable time frame, just throwing it out there. Um, not that everyone reads it, but you know, we have to do our job in giving folks the time. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we have had this conversation over the summer in talking about reaching people. Is that along the lines of what you mean, of making sure that the information, while we send the listserv out that says these are the policies we're going over, we still have people who aren't, they're probably receiving them in their inbox, but they're receiving a lot of things in their inbox, and that's not their primary way of receiving it. So that while it's important to send by email, we also need to find other ways so that people are receiving what we're intending them to. Right. Is that it? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think people, um, you know, look at information through different modes. I, I would hope to have it definitely in the newsletter. Sure. To what in, in upcoming policy shifts, and I, I don't, I, I think as many ways as we can get information out there is benefits all of us, and it benefits the, the level of transparency that we're able to provide, which I think improves the trust level between ourselves and the community. And I think doing that is definitely important, but I'm not sure it needs to be put into the policy because I feel like new forms of social media and communication come out so quickly. It's true. Right. You know, I mean, Twitter didn't exist six, seven years ago, and now sure. it's the way lots of folks get their news. So I think maybe that's partly why, as I'm reading this, it says um, um, accessibility is to the extent at least of all employees of the school district and to members of the committee, and in, in so far as conveniently possible to all members in the community, meaning it's on our website. We send out the emails. Maybe we do add... Twitter, whatever it is that we choose to do now, but I wouldn't spell out exactly what we're going to do in here. Well, that's because fair. Because it might change as technology evolves and right. the ways of communication evolve. Right. Now, that, that's absolutely fair, Jen. I, I think we have to, uh, I would not want to promote any one platform, right. social media platform versus the other, just that, you know, whatever social media platforms that the school currently uses to disseminate information to maximize that for communication purposes. Some, something to that effect. Again, you, you, you are working oh, you with want the us words. to put social media in there? So I, I even caution against that because social media may no longer be the, the way of communicating in, in five years. Could all be you Fortnite. Know? It could be some other, right, exactly. Like, <laughs> oh my you know, God. That, that didn't exist yes. until fairly recently ago. I, I have put, we might be communicating by video game. Right. Um, but I think that the fact that we're communicating it is the essential piece that we have to do it. Mm -hmm. And then we have to look at what modes are most appropriate given the times. So I agree with you on not including Twitter, Facebook, those names. But I think we can include social media. And in, you know we do review these policies. So if things change, we could change this. I mean, through policy is how we are guiding the administration right, mm -hmm. to implement what we are requesting. So we keep it high level enough, and then the administration can decide whether to go through Twitter or only Facebook and buys and why nots is in their court. That's my thought, but you know, obviously I know. open. I'm kind of against the idea of putting anything specific in the policy because I want to give the administration the flexibility of using email blasts or using whatever is the most appropriate for a sp for the time. I mean, I feel like now, if you're on our email list, you get a notification. Um, and if we want to consider adding something else, we certainly can, but we can because we don't have it in the policy that we can't. I appreciate your perspective, but I disagree. I'll leave it at that. Other thoughts? Like in terms of the, the timeline, Nancy, you suggested that we, we post this in the newsletter, and that would be a few days before? Or so I, I, I think as soon as we, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but I think it, it, the policy subgroup would know ahead of, ahead of when the agenda is going out even. It, it could be done as soon as kind of we know that these are the policies that we anticipate coming up. 
without jumping too far ahead in our agenda tonight, I, I do think that having a policy section in our, it's really more of a blog, but is a bonus that allows people that accessibility at whatever timeline we think is most appropriate. And I, I know part of it depends on when the subgroup is able to meet relative to each. Right. That's right. Well, I worry about constraining them or making right. them feel guilty by setting up. Because it's a fast turnaround. How do you do it? It's a right. fast it's turnaround. Like, I think prior is really nice. Prior. Right. Prior. I, prior, because I'm going to guess, without putting you t three on the spot, that you probably have already figured out what policies are coming for the next meeting before this meeting even. Well, actually, we have, yeah. so it's okay. You yes. can put us on the spot. Um, yeah. But there may come a month when that's not the case because schedules don't line up to have the meeting or whatever. Right, right. Or things get pushed forward or whatever. Yeah, something yeah. comes up in, in practice. That, that mandates a review. So. Right. Well, that's that's right. Sometimes something comes through higher aboves. I feel like, it, you know, to Mina's point, um, I think it's a really interesting point. I think how we communicate is is very important, obviously, and it's obviously a focus of, of all of our, you know, term here uh, and your focus with the newsletter and whatnot. But I'm wondering if maybe it's a procedure, a communications procedure, or some supporting document um, that might mm. require some broader thinking. Like, e even, um, you know, speaking from the standpoint of the subcommittee for the website, which is what I'm currently uh, very active in, it's hard to know, it would be helpful to have a procedure that said, here's how we communicate to you know, a broad group of staff, or here's how we communicate to all residents, or here's how we communicate to parents. Um, and I, I think our administrative staff is pretty astute with this. Um, we as school committee we sort of come on and go off, and they sort of right. keep the motor running, which is great. Um, but it might be useful to step back and think about a communication p policy or procedure. I'm not sure which it would be. I like that. How, what our take is on the appropriate use for us of t of social media, or the appropriate use for school committee of Twitter, or I don't know. I like the idea of a procedure yeah. because procedures can be updated more in real time with the changing yeah. mediums of how people are communicating. Kind of like how you did the um, the minutes procedure, which yes now will make it much easier for the next person who has something to take minutes on right. to then know how to do it. Like when we have important things to communicate, it'd be nice to have that. As a new member, I feel like it'd be mm -hmm. nice to have that. I guess, you know, I've shared my views and, you know, when you all go back, clearly we'll have a second reading. So think about all of these things. Mm -hmm. I'm open to hearing all of these. Um, you know, would the procedure be something that we own or would it be the administration and would it fall under you know, how do we attach that? So, yeah, absolutely things for you to think about. And if you come back with that recommendation, no social media? All right. Thank you. So I think that's lots to think about there. So that brings us up to um, item H, which is the budget message. And obviously we were all at the budget message meeting at the Board of Selectmen and I at the time you may recall that the Board of Appro uh, Todd Sestari of the Board of S Appropriations had requested from both the Board of Selectmen and from the school committee to have a directive to in their case the town manager in our case the superintendent directing them and I don't have the exact wording because we can we can come up with our own motion should we choose or not should we choose and I wanted just to take a moment to reflect on that and to kind of discuss how we want to move forward. I think I was not comfortable in the moment taking up the motion because it didn't feel like we would have the space. Number one, it wasn't posted on our agenda where the budget message was posted on their agenda. Uh, and number two, so I, I was concerned about open meeting law on our behalf. But And number two, I didn't feel like we had the space to really think about it and really toss around what it is that we want to do. In the meantime, I have received um, actually more feedback than I would have guessed um, for people who felt one way or the other. So I think 
one thing that I have heard, um, and clearly I think from sitting in that room, the sense that I had would, was very clear that the Board of Appropriations and the Board of Selectmen felt very strongly that we should do this. And I do think that we want to work in a collaborative spirit with them. I also feel like when where we are the budget group here, that this is the superintendent makes a recommendation to us, and ultimately, it's our budget in this case. So I feel like there is a lack of our involvement when we're tasking the superintendent to go back and discuss this without any member of our team present. Mm -hmm. I'm weighing out a number of things for consideration, not saying mm -hmm. definitively one way or the other. We also do have a, every year the chairs of each, the school committee, the board of selectmen and the appropriations, the, those three chairs meet with the town manager and the school committee if we are looking to have a smaller discussion rather than the whole group. But I, whatever we decide to do, I want it to be what we've decided because we've carefully considered what is the best in our case with the superintendent and with how we want to do our budget while also managing that we have we do have a fiduciary responsibility to the town and to the residents of the town. Um, so that's, I, I would like to hear how others were feeling in that moment and if we would like to craft a motion, what we would like our motion to look like, and if not, how we would like to send that message back as to we still want to collaborate. Because I, I don't ever think we want the message to be that we're not collaborating, because we do want to collaborate, but how we want to word that is our our decision as a board. So, does anybody have any? I think the concern on the part of the Board of Selectmen and the Appropriations Committee was it was reasonable in light of what happened last year, the difficulty mm -hmm. of it. But at the same time, I think that I feel uncomfortable giving my superintendent a directive to do the job she already knows how to do yes. so very well. Right. Um, and so if we can reword that or rephrase it, I'd be happy with that. It, as long as I make clear that I fully respect the Board of Selectmen Absolutely. and the Appropriations Committee sentiment that they just don't want us all to be in the same chaotic state we were last February. Right. Which may or right. may not be the case come uh, I, February. I would hope, I, I would expect not. I think we're going into this, it's a new year, we're starting fresh and we're figuring where we're going. We, we also do have um, a, a different way of evaluating the superintendent than the Board of Selectmen has of evaluating the town manager, which is that we will evaluate Dr. Cavanaugh next, in 2019, as a committee in public. That's right. So that That's right. I, I think that whether or not we pass a directive here, the expectation, I, I have every bit of confidence that this is how it's going to work, whether we have this formality or we don't. Yeah. And I would like it to be, I'm sorry, do you want to go? No. I, I, would, I would definitely like it to be, um, I guess my concern is I don't want it to be just the town manager and the superintendent locked in a room. Yeah. Um, Th that's because what I was there are at, many yeah. more de departments to consider, um, and, and the Board of Appeals and the Board of Selectmen are, of course, involved. So I'm 100% behind the idea of there being a group that meets, mm -hmm. and if it needs to be on a regular basis, that's fine. That includes the town manager, the superintendent, a representative from the Board of Appeals, a representative from our committee, and representative from the Board of Selectmen. Um, but I'm very uncomfortable with the idea of saying, you two need to go meet in a locked room and come up with something and come back out. I don't think that is in the spirit of transparency that everyone is throwing this word around all the time. I feel like that's very much a closed door session. So I, um, I'm uncomfortable also making a directive. I feel like if a committee or a subcommittee or a working group or a group of people that represent all of the major town departments want to get together and work collectively to establish some criteria for the budget, I think that's a great idea. I'm 100% behind that, but I don't feel comfortable saying just the two of you should go work together. 
Um, so first thing I want to say <coughs> is um, the overall budget message was passed, but I think underlying that, um, the preliminary assumptions that were made with schools at 6.5%, I was excited about that. So I want to call that out, um, the 6.5% increase uh, expected or projected on the school front. So knowing where we are with you know the growth, I'm glad that that was recognized and put out there in the initial assumptions uh, spreadsheet. So I'm happy about that. With regard to the specific uh, directive, um, I, I actually want to hear Dr. Kavanaugh's thoughts. Um, you know, obviously there's some history, right? That's the reason why this thing came about. So what are your thoughts? I mean, obviously this is how we are expected to function. When you, two people sit together and they have to work, what are your thoughts? I think I'm probably in agreement with what Mrs. Devlin just said, that I feel like if um, if Mr. Kamalo and I are in a room, I'm happy to work, you know, collectively, collaboratively, alongside him. But I, I do have the concern that there are five people on this board that the community elected and five people on the Board of Selectmen that the community elected. And I think in a way to foster transparency, maybe there should be someone from each of the boards and someone from appropriations as well. Yeah, did it feel like that it was being said that you two get in the room and discuss? Did you feel that? I thought that the message was that Mr. Kamalo and the superintendent would work together to kind of iron out the budget. And I understand the spirit of it because I did go through the budget process last year and things did get, you know, a little uh, difficult in May, we'll call it, or in the spring, I should say, not in May. Um, so I, I think that for this year, I am optimistic. I think that going in, um, we have, um, I think, a very positive attitude. We have some good things to work with. Um, and despite some of the challenges that we have with increased enrollment and building capacity, I, I think that we're all very willing to roll up our sleeves and get some good work done this year, really. Um, and, you know, obviously, I, I work at your directive, so whatever you ultimately decide, I am happy to do. So. But, since you asked, I answer. No, no, I, I really appreciate your perspective. Um, I think that's understood pretty much that you will work. And to me, the important thing, having experienced last year, we went meeting after meeting after meeting, and that was painful. Um, and so to me, it was actually helpful to hear all perspectives from all the departments, to hear the pain that everyone is feeling. I, I think that helped. But to go through that over and over again was painful with that we didn't have much to contribute in that at that point. Of course, listening helps mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. in the final decision making. So without having a motion also, I think the request remains, which I think you would just do very well at. And if there are any breaks, as I was making a point that night, we have to bring it up if something is breaking. You know, you talked about the difficulty in spring, right? We need to bring that up and highlight what the difficulty is and just be open about it and honest about it and see how we can help you. And I think through the budget process, I'm always grateful to see people from appropriations and the Board of Selectmen here, you know, sort of listening to all that, you know, goes on in our meetings. Uh, but maybe those smaller meetings would even give us an opportunity for more communication beyond what happens in this sort of formalized meeting setting. Right. I also think that as a board, it's our job to support you in some difficult situations. So I wouldn't want to shy away from the job we have to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but we rely on you to tell us that you need our help. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Thank you. So in terms of communicating back to our partners um, in the town. Uh, it would be nice, I think, if we did have a, a formal d acceptance of how we would like to move that forward from our end. Can we um, say something to the effect that just like we always do, you know, build, build it ground up Right. Yes, absolutely. Um, and knowing that even though there is there is growth and so we have to do what we have to do, look for ways and means um, to bring more efficiency as you're planning the budget out, right? 
or get rid of some inefficiencies rather. Um, those are some things that come to mind. Uh, I think, again, you do all of this anyway. Uh, but uh, again, I think it's still important that um, the wellness, the educational welfare of our kids is of utmost importance. So we should not uh, cut corners there. Yes, and I don't want to discount the role that Mrs. Rothermick plays in the budget process yes, too. Right. I mean, she really is the brains behind the operation. I, right? I should so. have added that in my vision, it would be Mrs. Rothermick and also when the town has a finance yes, person I agree. in there, I think. Yeah. I, in my mind, that went without saying, so. Me too. Me too. <laughs> then I thought about it. Um, and one last word was level services, right? We don't want to cut anything. Right? I, it would always be my sincere hope that we're able to deliver a level service budget within the constraints that we have, but I'm not sure that um, until we've seen those budgets built from the ground up, I'm guessing that's a hard commitment to guarantee. It is. Mm -hmm. Will given. we build it under the assumption that we're maintaining level services for next year, no additions or subtractions other than the needs of the student population that's coming in? Or do we have do we have anything in the pipeline that we want to, that we know is going to be added to it? In terms of programming? Yeah. There yeah. isn't anything that I'm thinking of right now. Is there anything that you're thinking of? I, mean, I think there'll be textbooks and things like that. Sure. There might be some shifting of resources. I don't know if there'll be significant additions. That, is that pretty typical, though, sort of year to year? There's always some new textbooks coming in. Always. Somebody, yeah, so, I mean, it's not something different from, mm -hmm. from previous years. Sorry, so, so, no, so many so words at you. I know you have good words, so I'm going to just start to throw some words out there and hope that everyone will edit along with me. So can I ask so, a question first? I'm yeah. oh, sorry. The intent of the motion at the Board of Selectmen seem to be that we collaborate early and often. Yes. It's sort of what I, so we, and, there and were other. also to catch when it, things break down, down the road of where, what, yes. what do we do now? Absolutely, I think, absolutely, that's what I took away. Sort of get together early and often and escalate ASAP when things seem to be um, not going smoothly or we have uh, issues at surface. So. I like, I think it's an excellent, as you said, the spirit of that was important. And I think I agree. We, we're on a path to do that anyway, but saying it is, is important. Um, I echo what I think everybody has said that, you know, it feels more appropriate for us to be as a team with the representatives from the elected board um, there to support you and help with um, transparency and, you know, help with the process. I think it's important that we have representation. Um, but somewhere in whatever words you're jotting down, I would like to make sure we capture that, the spirit that motivated the motion at the Board of Selectmen meeting, because I think that yeah. is driving it. So, I'm trying to think of the exact word that I want to catch with to say that, um, I would say perhaps in the spirit of collaboration. Yeah. So I, this is what I have. In the spirit of collaboration, uh, the school committee affirms our commitment to build our budget from the ground up, to look for ways and means to achieve ef efficiencies, but you've then reworded that, and I didn't get it exactly. I said um, to reduce inefficiencies. And there was something else. I think we want to have something. Educational to, welfare. Yes. To not compromise the educational welfare of our students. So I, or something. Cha I, I changed to meet the uh, to sure. best meet the educational welfare of all of our students. I think that sounds great. And okay, now I've made too many crossouts. Um, I'm going to type what you're saying. Oh, that would be fantastic. So in, in, in the spirit of collaboration, the school, the school committee affirms our commitment to building a budget from the ground up, looking for ways and means 
to decrease inefficiencies and to meet the to best meet the educational welfare of all students and then that I think I think requires a new sentence um, Can you go back for a second yes such an, uh, okay accomplished typer um, oh. building a budget from the ground up what was the, your part about how did you word the inefficiencies <coughs> section Looking, looking for ways and means to decrease inefficiencies. Okay, and then they can, and best meet the education and to, of all and, and ways to best meet the educational welfare of all students. Okay. Um, and then the next sentence, I think, it, it, I would like to deal with when in the event that things do break down how that will be escalated immediately to the smaller group to a smaller group discussion to include the the finance directors an elected official from the school committee board of appropriations and board of selectmen the superintendent and the town manager I don't I don't have that written down so I may have missed nouns verbs or um, other p parts of speech do you want me to pass this on to her yes I can I no can I, I, you, you're fine I'm okay um, so that final sentence we're looking for a way to say essentially that we do we even want we it to be when things break down or we seek to fully cooperate oh, we, with yes okay. collaboration with members of the blah 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 yeah, with like members that. of the blah, 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 and um, <laughs> okay, we've all just pretty much called ourselves here, blah, blah, blah. blah. <laughs> with uh, absolutely no disrespect intended on my part, purely inefficient. Uh, purely inefficiency. Right. Clearly. Uh, so, um, in the spirit of collaboration and transparency, um, um, we will work collaboratively do we need a timeline or just um, with elected officials from the school committee board of appropriations and board of I, so I as well as the should discussion? we should we say I wish that we could just rewind this like a tape um, should we say to work with, I think we need to change the order because I think I, of how we say it. I think we should say this, the superintendent, the town manager, the finance directors, and the chairs of the school committee, board of appropriations, and board of selectmen. Okay. Just in terms of the way the sentence flows. Is that, I'm looking to you now because I, I look for you for all things linguistic. I don't want too many cooks in this <laughs> Maybe you have some herbs to add. Yep, you got a you got a source for collaborative. Like. I'm just curious: is there a an expected a regularity to our interactions with the other boards? I don't know what happens between maybe you and your, the other chairs or uh, Dr. Kavanaugh and. Uh, Mr. Kamala. So the smaller group does meet regularly that we have not met as a um, budget. It's, it's the budget advisory group is what it is. Okay. But it, we have met with Mr. Kamala, Mrs. Wright, and Dr. Kavanaugh and I. Um, but at our next meeting, we will include the um, finance directors and the Board of Appropriations in on that. The, the first was more of a kind of how are things going mm -hmm. um, kind of a Thing. And, and also, we, you know, we talked about things just simply like different ways of Mr. Kamala was talking about doing shared things together, um, like when they came to center school or like things that he had ideas of doing a bonding type of a thing, but mm -hmm. to improve our working relationship as a whole, not just... So well, shared understanding of the different challenges facing different departments and, and exactly. different aspects of the community, definitely. And to be proactive. Um. Do you want to add something like we will ensure we will meet um, regularly or in a timely manner? 
Close, yeah, I, yeah. So, the, so there is an actual entity called the Budget Advisory Group. Yes, Forgive is. my ignorance. This is but my first okay. time yeah. down the budget That's, path. It, that is, yes, just sort of, I, I have not been on it before because I have not been the school committee chair before, but it was last year. It was, were you, did you sit in on that? I did you not. Must, no, okay, Dr. so McLeod it was Dr. McLeod still. and Jean, and oh, Susan would have sat in on that. Yeah. So you've, you've got the inside <laughs> scoop. Yeah, so I mean, we met once a month and okay. talked about um, you know where we were with the budgets and uh, you know we were just kind of getting into that the, the um, financial projections were changing a little bit yeah. and it was the first that we were really introduced to the financial projections okay. last year but we talked about um, where we were each time and was appropriations in that as well mm -hmm. okay so so it sounds like we have this basically entity. the committees yeah. that you okay. or the people that you're naming in this motion was in this meeting okay and we meet regularly it, it seems like this is sort of we're sort of restating what's happening right. anyway right. okay i'm I mean, sorry i'm just coming up um, to speed slowly we are but i think it would my thought on, on taking a, a motion is that we're offering back that we intend to do this and that issues will be escalated to the full committee, I think, would be the... And we're committed to... to we're committed to working on this and to working as, you know, one town that we're all Hopkinton and... That, Absolutely. I, mean, I think the way that they're doing the budget, they did not give us, while they were looking at the underlying assumptions being perhaps six and a half percent they're really looking to us to work with the town to hit the three percent tax impact and the hope would be right. but until we've built our budget from the ground up we don't know if we're going to be 6.8 or 6.3 or what right it's hard to jump a num an exact number ahead of the work that we have right the very fun exciting work we have in the um, coming months mm -hmm. So are we ready to um so it says in the spirit of collaboration the school committee affirms our commitment to building a budget from the ground up looking for ways and means to limit efficiencies to increase to, to oh, decrease inefficiency decrease sorry <laughs> we won't increase them i promise um and best meet the educational welfare of all students so, but is limit a better word for it is limit inefficiencies perhaps because decrease implies there may be there some. Were, yeah and we're hoping that we did a good job building from the ground up is that reduce there are always inefficiencies okay okay minimize sure <laughs> minimize there we go there we go um, in the spirit of collaboration and transparency, we'll re we will work regularly with the superintendent, town manager, finance directors, and elected chairs of the um, school committee, board of appropriations, and board of selectmen. We will meet both regularly and in a timely manner as issues arise. And is that, did I hear that motion being made? Are we ready? Yet? Can I hear it one more time, please? Yes. In the spirit of collaboration, the school committee affirms our commitment to building a budget from the ground up, looking for ways and means to minimize inefficiencies and best meet the educational welfare of all students. In the spirit of collaboration and transparency, we will work regularly with the superintendent, town manager, finance directors, and elected chairs of the school committee, board of appropriations, and board of selectmen. We will meet both regularly in an, and in a timely manner as issues arise. Just, um, can we serve the educational welfare of our children? Do we meet educational welfare? Can we, what's a, what's a, do we meet the educational welfare or do we serve it? Mm -mm. That's a good question. I kind of like serve. serve. So sounds good. I think. I think serve. And do we have to say anything about bringing anything back to the full board which was the point that Mina had made they also use the word we right is it for us that we're talking about just want to clarify that in the second so I so go ahead sorry in the first paragraph it says the school committee 
So the we, I think, would imply the school committee. Is that what you want? Yeah. It's fine. It's okay. It's fine. <laughs> She's okay. Just look at it. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it could be crisped up a bit, but. Right, right. You know, but it's on the fly with right, five people right, exactly. and one person typing right. and too many words. Yeah. Well, we double we collaborated. Have that, in the spirit of transparency, okay. we will fully collaborate. All right. Yeah. I, but I think this is part of us being intentional, and I think it's also part of it, it's important to me anyway, and it, that it, we are working collaboratively with the boards, and that while our motion is worded differently, mm -hmm. our, our intent is not any different. We have the same intent right. behind it, and the same spirit of wanting to work things out and whatnot. Thank you for inviting this discussion. Do we need a motion? So yes. So are we ready for an official motion, or do we have any? Do you guys want to take? That's Jen. Yes. No one else can. No. <laughs> <laughs> can you can you read it back one more time just to make sure we're um we're 100 percent? All right. right. So here's we'll my uh, yes. Oh yes. I'm, nice and we loud. We accept this as our budget. Message. Our what is it? Our budget what? Our um. Affirmation. Then we had some words, but. What are we calling it? Our di budget directive. Our budget message. It's our budget message. All this right. is our budget message. All right. So this is, I move that we approve this. Ready? In the spirit of collaboration, the school committee affirms our commitment to building a budget from the ground up, looking for ways and means to minimize inefficiencies and best serve the educational welfare of all students. In the spirit of transparency, we will fully collaborate with the superintendent, town manager, finance directors, and elected chairs of the school committee, board of appropriations, and board of selectmen. We will meet both regularly and in a timely manner as issues arise. Okay, so arise. discussion on the motion. When I hear the motion back, it sounds like we as a whole school committee are meeting. Does that, is that just me? No, you're right, and that's what I was asking about the V part, right? Uh, okay. I think. Um, but although it, it, it's okay to say that this, this is something that we think we're going to work on, but we still look to you, the okay. budget advisory group, to do the work. The budget advisory right? group. To Can we do change the initial that work and discussion. Yeah. Should we change that final way to the budget advisory group? Yes. It would make Nancy comfortable. Sorry, I, I just I want to make sure that, that yes. the well, received end is as clear as what we're intending yeah. when they see it, that we're not. Yeah. That's good. Okay. Yeah. And is that make sense from your It does. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So. One last time. One last time mm -hmm. so that we can have it in our minutes Final appropriately. Final take. Right. Can you, can you actually send me a copy and paste of that so I can Absolutely. pass that along? All right. This is what we're voting on. In the spirit of collaboration, the school committee affirms our commitment to building a budget from the ground up, looking for ways and means to minimize inefficiencies and best serve the educational welfare of all students. In the spirit of transparency, we will fully collaborate with the superintendent, town manager, finance directors, and elected chairs of the school committee, board of appropriations, and board of selectmen. The budget advisory group will meet both regularly and in a timely manner as issues arise. Is there a second on that motion? Second. So motion by Jen, second by Meg. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and I appreciate your um, patience with me as we no, read that through was, that several it's times. Good. It's good. So the next thing that we are moving on to is the, um, the turf fields. And the reason we are moving to the turf fields is for those who have not seen, um, our turf fields are actually looking really good. 
And as part of a memorandum of understanding uh, back in, I believe it was January, the school committee and Parks and Rec uh, it came up with a document governing how we would have a um, an oversight committee. And in conversation with our town clerk, it turns out that our oversight committee actually needs to be established not the turf committee itself was a subcommittee of the school committee. This is a different committee because it's looking at oversight and things, looking at things like the maintenance for the upcoming year, the, the things that have to be budget, budgeted, the seasonal usage of it, scheduling, all the things that are inherent in an actual field that's running. So in order for us to have this subcommittee that we have, or not subcommittee, it would be actually a full committee, that is outlined in our MOU, we need to have a motion from the school committee and from Parks and Rec, so they have to do their own separate meeting to request from the Board of Selectmen that the um, such a committee be created and that then they will uh, create a committee for the oversight of the turf field in conjunction with the school committee and Parks and Rec, and I will just um, I apologize, I was going to print this for you all tonight, but my printer is not working. So I will just, if you will bear with me, read to you who the members of that committee are as stated in the mem MOU. So it would consist of one member of the school committee, one member of the Parks and Recreation Commission, the Hopland, Hopkinton Public Schools Director of Finance and Operations, the Town Finance Director, the Athletic Director, the Director of Buildings and Grounds, and the Director of Parks and Rec Recreation. So um, if we approve this, then uh, Mr. Terry and I will go before the Board of Selectmen and request that they create this committee. It will not fall under our jurisdiction, but obviously we have representations there as per the MOU, but also because it falls on our property. So uh, are we dissolving the existing subcommittee? It, it, it has not been dissolved yet, but it will be dissolved, yes. Okay. So currently it is in addition to that until you come and tell us. It is currently us. not a committee yet. No, no, I, I mean the subcommittee. You'll let us know when it's ready to be dissolved. Yes, I will. Okay, and do. It, Sounds good. So, and I will, after after this, I will give a little bit of a, a blurb on that. Okay. Just in terms of, so I would, um, are there any other questions? Okay, I request a motion for the approval of the request for a committee for oversight of the turf fields with the Board of Selectmen and Parks and Recreation Committee. So moved. Second? Second. So motion by Meg, second by Amanda. All those in favor? Yes. So um, just as a note, um, because we we're talking about the turf field subcommittee is going to meet again. Uh, one of the things that, that you may recall from town meeting was the commitment for the, the turf fields to raise some of the funds to help offset the death of the town and they are actively working on that a, a subgroup of that so that I will have more to report on that after that we have come together for that. Sorry, Nancy, can I just ask one clarifying Absolutely. thing? Absolutely. Um, this is n not at all related to the Fruit Street turf fields. It's con it's just correct. the school turf. I, I'm sorry, yes, correct. Okay. It is, it, it is, but it, the, it, part of the reason it involves Parks and Rec is not just because they use the fields here, but because there's some collaboration between how the fields are run there and how the fields will be run here. Yes. Yeah, so Except yeah, that yeah. these fields, the priority is first the high school being able to play on them, but also town groups. But this new oversight committee is not responsible for Fruit Street. Correct. Okay. Okay. So that um, brings us to old business policy IJ instructional materials and textbook selection and adoption all right so we are bringing this one back for a second reading uh, when we looked at it last time we had discussed that what our current um, textbook adoption policy said was not what was actually happening in terms of procedure in our schools so we had brought this one forth and we reviewed it and the two changes that were uh, suggested are those that you see in red that we add instructional materials to line one and indicate that the materials should meet the learning profile of the entire student population. So those changes have been made. I like the changes. Can I ask a question? Did the second change meet 
Did we have before it must be appropriate for the learning profile? We, I don't think we had anything. No, but I think we did talk about appropriate. I think we That's okay. we didn't like appropriate. No, I think we might have forgotten. <laughs> Where you were. <laughs> may have just been lost in translation. Like it. It's just okay. You want you me to profile? How do you do? So you want it to say. Oh, you mean that? Yeah. Must, so be, a, it must, must be appropriate. Okay. For the learning profile of this learning profile okay. of the okay. student population. And one other little thing that I don't know how I missed it the first time around in number six. Um, they must provide for all students an effective basic education that does not discriminate on the basis of race, age, color, religion, national origin, sex, gender identity, ability, or sexual orientation. We have it limited to physical ability. Mm disabilities and that's way too limiting. Hmm. Right. So you want me to put in the word ability and where would you like that? Uh, I think... Could we take out physical disabilities? You, you don't discriminate on the basis of ability. I don't think we need physical disabilities. Got it. Just ability and that can refer to both intellectual and physical mm -hmm. and emotional. I can even think coherently this time of night. It's good. So, uh, for the first line, what's the recommendation? Appropriate. Where should the appropriate be? Because I'm thinking we can just suggest the amendment and move forward with it, mm -hmm. right? Yes. They must be appropriate for the learning. They must be appropriate for the learning profile mm -hmm. of the entire student population. Of the student population, yeah. Okay, I've made that correction and removed physical disabilities and added ability in its place. That's a very good point mm -hmm. because sometimes, you know, whatever may be your ability, mm -hmm. yeah. you can be discriminated for That's that. Right. Any other comments? And are people comfortable with those edits going forward and um, adopting the policy with yeah. those edits? I want to move. Okay. I want to move this thing. <laughs> All right. If everybody is comfortable and there are no um, there's no further questions, suggestions, comments on this, I would. Seek a motion to approve the policy as amended. Policy IJ as amended. So moved. Second. Second. Motion by Mina, second by Meg. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Yes. And it so passes. And that brings us down to policy JJF, student activity account, for a, also for a second reading. Yes, and I don't think anything has changed on this one um, since we saw it last time. We did send it to the student council students at the high school, and they sent it back saying that they were very pleased with the way it looked. That's great. Yes. So they did give you that feedback? Yeah. They did. Oh, yes. fantastic. Yep. Went across the street and came right back. It's <laughs> good. Yes, it well, just like the tennis balls. <laughs> uh, so are there any other comments for on that policy before we look to approve that. So um, in that case, I would seek a motion to approve policy JJF as outlined in our agenda materials. So moved. Second. Is there a second? I'll so, throw it out there, second. So motion by Meg, second by Jen. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Yes. Right. So Aye. carries, and that brings us, I believe, to the um, school committee newsletter. and. Can you pull that up mm -hmm. on your computer for me, please? Yes, I can. Thank you. So we had last time and um, just looked at it briefly, but it was we didn't have the interactive piece, which I'm hoping that we're going to be able to do, to to do here. But one of the things we had talked about was um, gone off. Mm -hmm. Oh, it did go off. I think. Got it. Thank we you. Can talk time for a uh, it talked about was specific uh, areas that we would like to see added in there. We had talked about uh, po a policy area and also talked about uh, a highlight of the motions that have, a after the meeting, highlight of the motions that have been 
past, um, sort of similar, the Board of Selectmen actually does put out something that says what motions they've passed after the meeting, mm -hmm. which I think is nice for people that are following along. So are there other, do, oh. no, no, I was just yeah. kind of point too. Thank you. And, and then I think also there will be some things that will come up that are, are not maybe a general category. Uh, for example, we have the budget coming up. There might be something that we, I, we want to explain about the budget. Yeah, I, I would think, you know, for instance, um, the forum that we had, yes. the diversity forum, or if we, as we get closer, the check, the preparation, you know, the awareness speaker series, if you will, or Amanda was talking about uh, a survey that's going to go out. Mm -hmm. So things of that nature or, or any other meetings or anything else that we want to post, right? Mm -hmm. That we want to, what we got excited about, what we learned perhaps at, uh, that's great. at a okay. liaison role or one of those meetings that we attend subcommittees I think I, one of I those think, are yeah right? I think the idea of being able to share I mean I think the five of us at our work learn a lot in, right. in doing the job of being on school committee and some of that I'd like to share yes with the community because of course well it's very important for it to inform our votes and there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes um, there isn't currently a great forum to maybe share um, through our work, what we've learned that other people can also benefit from. So it could take a lot of forms, either when we're at tech or off at the STEM club or whatever, whatever, you know, we might right. in our liaison work or even in our, our prep research for the topics that come up each meeting, we might um, stumble across a did you know kind of a topic that the general community would be like, well, they probably don't know. And we could do like a did you know piece that would shed light. Yeah. Right? Um, and, and, you know, in general, I think the liaison reports, we have so much yeah. to offer that we bring, right? Yes. If we could type that out and share it, I think that'd be nice. Um, although I'm just wondering procedurally, uh, would we be looking to approve it in some shape or form or whoever is assigned that role of liaison is, uh, we are kind of approving that you can, share a note and write it out, and if someone has any issue, we just bring it, uh, or share that feedback about some words or whatever. So I'm going to speak a little bit off the cuff, because sure. this is something that I think is important to cover. I, I know when in communicating with the Holliston School Committee, they spend time in each of their meetings approving everything that goes in. I don't know that we want to sp to me, I envision a lot of content that would be useful for people to see that we might not want to go over. You think about how much time we spend on policy. Yeah. We might not want to bring everything back here. I would think for sure liaison roles, whatever people's liaison roles are, you probably know way more than the other four people about your particular role and what you're doing and what's current in there. It's not breaking, it wouldn't be breaking any rules, it's so not, to speak. I it's, don't think right. it would. If we, if we put stuff up and if it, we were just reporting about our liaison role, there's nothing. Right. Because we don't vote it's on just, it here either, right? It's, so, it, it, yeah, the only, it would be only breaking open meeting law if we were discussing it beforehand. Okay. That, that if one of us prints it or, or like writes it and it gets added into the blog, then Before it's not violating. It. But if, for example, we did it, we couldn't, for example, if you were wanted to do something on a policy, like the three of us couldn't meet about it and okay, edit it right, together, right, okay. that that would violate open, it, we, we could do it in an open meeting, but I, our meetings are lengthy enough without having to add, that. that's my feeling, I'm open to. So if we do it after the meeting, it's just a summary of what happened, as opposed to a did you know thing, which might be able to be put in ahead so of time because it's not like right. it's debatable or right. so a, like yeah. a did you know we could yeah. do more collectively somebody could take a stab at it if we wanted to um, where it's collective but I wouldn't want to edit every single thing in here yeah. Yeah. right I, I guess what I'm thinking is you know um, I'm, I'm trying to look a little bit ahead right yes. uh, we are I think uh, rock star school well, committee uh, but 
let's say there are issues and the verbiage that uh, one school committee member uses mm -hmm. is not acceptable to others. Mm -hmm. We should have a mechanism to give that feedback and correct it. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. So maybe we could do it as an items by consensus rather than discussing each thing. It could go into. Or, or perhaps uh, put the onus on everyone to say, did anyone have any issues? And if anyone has any issue that could be brought up at the next school committee, I don't know. Just, like you mean, so. it, like if we read the items by cons or, or no, separate from that. Hmm. Like if we read them and then if we had issues, we would bring hmm. them up and otherwise they would just be voted as acceptable? Or what are you thinking? I'm sorry, I thought that's what you're, where you were going. No, I guess what I'm saying is that there has to be a mechanism if someone is disagreeing, mm -hmm. and I'm open to hearing whatever that mechanism is of sharing that I don't agree with this or we should think right. to correct this mm -hmm. language because we are sharing it as a school committee. Well, and I think that's a good point, that I do think that there's a, there is something nice about it being a shared thing and that y you may find something I write to be horribly objectionable right. and if it goes directly out there from my computer it's awkward to then have to say in the meeting well, maybe it wouldn't be awkward for you but I would feel awkward having to say you know what that that's it's better to stop it from going out yes than it is to have to pull it back is more my point that, that's true yeah. too so right. I like your idea, though. If, if it was part of our packet, right. it's already public. Right. Mm. We have an opportunity to review it. If we have a, yeah. some, a concern, that's what gets brought up at the meeting. And we pull out that number, or that letter, rather. So we pull out I and say, I want to consider this one separately. Sure. The rest of them are, we're fine with. And then we can. Then so, yeah, so I'm just thinking timelines, right? So um, we have our meetings on Thursday. We'll, once it gets approved, we'll get it published on Friday, right? The other part is fine. But in terms of submission to go into that packet, mm -hmm. it has to meet the at least Monday <coughs> it's, timeline. She, she really needs, I think, Wednesday beforehand. The, so, like, it would be Wednesday, this coming Wednesday for the 18th. Yeah, I, the, I think that's a bit of a challenge, mm -hmm. right, from a timeline perspective, because we report all the way, because right now it's open, right. we report right. all the way into Thursday. So if I've had a meeting this morning, I report it. Right. It then becomes right. not new news. Right. If you're reporting it right now. But it'll get included in the next package, right? But would you put... <laughs> The liaison report for every well that's true not necessarily right. not necessarily because some people you know you just listen to it here and they would be happy with that right yeah they don't need to know constitutes news and what mm. is just news so we're saying that anything that we want included um, to go in next Friday we should have it in by this Wednesday correct so anything for the 18th should go in the this coming Wednesday, the exactly, Wednesday beforehand. Exactly, yes. the Wednesday beforehand. Yeah, that would be. So from a timeline perspective. All right, so then this, things get posted on the website a little bit later than when we present it in the meeting, but it's still up there eventually if folks right. are interested. Okay, all right. Okay. Are there any things that we would feel like I I like the idea of being able to include the HCAM recording because that's not something we're authoring. Um, and because HCAM is so lovely to um, record all of our meetings, it gives people a quick and easy place that people who aren't going to HCAM for as many things would be able to quickly find it. Sure. They don't subscribe to that channel. I um, think so too. Uh, one question I have is, you know, I like this idea of the offhand things that happen, like Dr. Kavanaugh's yes. interview. Uh, I'm just wondering, um, you know how we have the highlights from the Hill? It, so that kind of stuff, we still leave it on the main page? Is that is that how we will proceed? H highlights in the Hill would, would stay on the main page. We don't want it here. Oh, so... We could add a link for stuff like that here. I don't. Yeah, I'm just throwing it out there that what is right. the boundary here? Because this is a school committee's blog. Right. Right. And that is more a superintendent's blog, but I don't mind 
uh, you know, as publishing it or promoting it. So just throwing it out there that where is the line? Okay, if we put that in. What all are we promoting here? Are we going to promote something that happens? Uh, we're not doing the highlights on, say, the sports and things like that, right? I would, say no. I, would, I would say no on the sports. So I'll be okay with something like that? I think I would say being yeah. able to, I think that quick little blurb there is pulling things just out of the, I don't think that needs to come back here, but I'm open to yeah, no, no. I, I know. I'm. Ju I'm not even talking about the blurb. I'm just saying what all can go. So not the highlights from the hill. Right, no, which is a regular can, I feature. I think we can include the, the link for the highlights. From the hill? From the hill. Okay. I, 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 all things school. All things school that so, seem... Which seems great, but we have a school website. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> we right? do. Yep. So I know, there's like a funny sort of... Redundancy. Yeah, Redundancy. Yeah, where you're coming from, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't want to do that. Yeah. I, think, I think this is our unique place to share school we as school committee members what we think the community from the work that we do hasn't heard or maybe maybe i mean we talk about policy blah 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 but right. i mean what does it mean hey we have this policy here's why we looked at it like you could say in layman's plain english um you know what is this policy even for right. you know i think and this for me this is a place it's it's the only place that we can do that and i but i wouldn't want to dilute it with Others, all okay, the other yeah, so stuff. It's, it's wonderful stuff out there. So then, yeah. maybe the only things we want from like H Camp, for example, would be our meetings. I think so. I do I like, think it's a nice thing to put our meetings in there because yeah. it makes it easy, and that's that's about us. Yeah. I mean, not about us, but about what we do. So, so is it fair to say that this is highlighting the school committee's work, really? Yes, yes, absolutely. Right? Yes. So if that's the case, anything which is non-school committee, we're not putting it here. That seems Makes fair. Sense. Right? Yeah. That seems fair to me. So I do like the idea, and then we didn't, I mean, it's, it's uh, everything here is up as a placeholder, but I really like the idea of the community reading, the sharing of books or materials, which... I don't know how people felt about that, but I like it, the diversity of yeah. books that the staff might be reading. If it's something that might be digestible and relevant to a resident, I mean, a lot of people have a lot of other things to read, but there right. are things, topics that come up, and people think, "Gee, I wonder what Dr. Kavanaugh is reading on this," or you know, I don't know if you have a place, a superintendent place, where you would share that, but. Yeah. Superintendent's blog. Oh, great. <laughs> Maybe she needs one more I thing think, to do. I think you would be fantastic at it. I really think that. Do we want to put, kick that over to the main website, though? Because I do think it's a nice... Yeah, I know. That's tricky. Because we eliminate I, other things I, I'm, on school committee. I know. I love it, too. But I yeah. feel like it might not be appropriate. Maybe it's not relevant. Okay. It, it's, I, I think it's a nice thing to be able to share with people, but I'm trying to think of where the... I could be swayed either way. I really want Dr. Okay. Kavanaugh to think about a blog. Oh my gosh, no. <laughs> I so am much to do. No, we don't need to load more work. No. <laughs> so no, I, I think, anyway. I'm thinking seriously about it. <laughs> uh, so I am aware of looking at our, we're very close to Wednesday for putting things in the packet. So I would propose that we not put this for the next meeting, but that maybe people that have things that they would like to in the next between now and the next meeting to actually take a stab at writing some content. And so that our meeting at the beginning of November, which is, um, I'm gonna have to pull my calendar up to get the exact date. So the, the action item for that would be for our November 1st meeting and the packet for that would go out on the t October 24th. So that, I mean, it wouldn't go out, but that's when Georgette would need the information for the packet if people had things that they and I don't want to put pressure on anybody because different different times that we go out with this people will have different interesting and exciting things in their school committee lives and different availability in their real lives so there's no pressure for everybody to have to do this between now and then but anybody who's interested in writing something could maybe try to submit it by the 24th 
So Nancy, we, we, we still have the 10th, right? We can still make the 10th for the 18th. So we can, but that's less than a week for, if people want to get moving on content, I'm totally fine with that too. Why don't we give it a try? Okay. Is that? Try is a great way to put it. it. Yes. Yeah. Do we? <laughs> we it I'm, expecting, <laughs> I'm expecting some blow from you, Professor Tyler. You should write about the diversity forum. We should. Yeah, absolutely. Do something with that. I thought the diversity forum was an important thing and to look at. I think so, too. That would be a great way to slide those on in. the bookshelf. See that? That's where you could mm. put those oh, if you were going to. Ah, <laughs> uh, so. But you know, we don't want on the bookshelf. That's okay. <laughs> so then, in the meantime, maybe we could. Uh, and I'm looking at you, Amanda, just because we worked on this on yeah. the first round. We could work to move from demo mode to be ready to go into actual yes. launch after the content has been approved here. Yep. Does that make so sense? one other question. Um, where will this reside on the menu? Did you guys think about it? On the school committee page, you mean? Yeah. So I think we should have one uh, yes. which speaks to the blog, mm -hmm. and that's where it should reside. Okay. May maybe I can... Uh, on the landing page or on the, on the on menu? The, on the menu. Okay. Okay. Excellent. I'm excited because I do think this could be a good platform for us to share. Right, different things. So. Yeah, this would be a good challenge. Good challenge for us. Well, and, and we'll, I'm sure, learn as we go along and maybe yes. find areas that we didn't do as well as we thought we would. And we'll see. Are we sure that our viewing audience wants to hear more from us? <laughs> um, I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> Moving on. So, so if we're ready to leave that, then I'm going to um, move along to the next item, which is the school committee website review. Oh, that's me. So um, after we met last time, we again had an e-meeting, and uh, Professor Tyler and I took a stab at relooking at this uh, proposal for the uh, what we do with regard to the school committee work. So we added the word staggered, and I think we had feedback um, from Nancy about including um, working with the administration, right? Oh, why do I have two? Why do I see something different in the package versus what I had sent out? I do you do guys you know see the word staggered? Yes. Mm -hmm. So yes. I do see okay. the word staggered, but I I think item eight, that's a separate thing. Then. That's, right. that's fine. Okay. So I can I just to be a little bit picky, make a suggestion on that? It, it, just oh, ahead, just yeah. one moment, Nancy, if you don't mind. Um, I think the overall uh, for all of those things we need to work with the school administration and uh, the, the community right for each of those items i also felt we used the word listen in the first bullet and also later on but that's that's where we were that for all of those things to happen we need to work so yes please be picky so in my head when i was reading each board member is elected for a three-year staggered term mm -hmm. i was thinking it, of re, just rewording that to say members are elected for three year for staggered three year terms. Okay, mm -hmm. I like better. that. Let yes, let me better. make that change. Uh, I want to make a note of it, please. So, so you said, can you please so suggest that? Um, Board members are elected for staggered three-year terms. Okay. Okay, got it. So then down to the second bullet point where it says shaping the vision, mission, and goals of the Hopkinton Public Schools. I would like to see, it would be, it, this could just be me, but I would like to see something in there about the community and the administration. So something to the effect of working with 
school ad administration and the community. You had given that feedback. So if you look at the next, you know, the next thing that talks to to fulfill and support these functions, the school committee. So for all of those, we need that, right? We, Working with the school administration as well as the community. We do, but I guess what I'm looking at, like establishing and monitoring the annual operation operating budget, we actually do ourselves. That mm -hmm. that's the five of us, whereas the vision, mission, and goals are done in conjunction as part of the strategic plan. But don't you think even with the budget, we have to work with the administration and we do take feedback from the community? None of those things we do in isolation, right? We, we are representative. I agree, but in terms of mass general laws, what's called out as being our business alone would be the hiring, managing, and evaluating the superintendent policies in the budget, whereas okay. the, the rest just from a purely legal standpoint, I guess, would be that, that we share those. Okay. I, I, I don't I, I would I don't want to just have that be my voice. I would like to hear. I, I agree with you. I think, if others. I think you're right. I think the okay. administration, and we will be working on a strategic plan, and, and I think that is definitely um, coming community. from the administration, working in partnership with them, but it's not something that we own in isolation we participate I, yeah i feel like for all of these that's how it works besides the first point right if you look at whether it's our budget whether it is evaluation whether it is setting and reviewing district policies and practices none of those things we do in isolation they all have to be done in conjunction both with the administration and the school community at large right and you know, the rest of the community. That's how I look at it, like each of those. None of those will be done in isolation by us. How could we possibly do that? But the ultimate decision, made, the ultimate responsibility for the last three, I think, sits with us, squarely with us, according to our charter with the Mass MASC and the Mass General Law, whatever. But what the word we are using is shaping. We are not saying owning, right? Mm -hmm. So we are saying we help shape, right? The word uses shaping. And so that is done in conjunction with the superintendent. Would it make you more comfortable if we use some of this verbiage up top when we talk with every uh, student's educational welfare as a topmost priority? The committee is and in working in conjunction with um, the district administration and the school community the committee is responsible for does that help to have those words up front rather than later I guess what I'm struggling with is the not wanting to set unrealistic expectations in the community that people look to us to help with specific things and all of these things we want to help them with I mean we want to listen to them and we want to work with them and we want to represent their voices at the end of the day we take all that they've had to say and, and by by law those three things we own the rest we sort of own by the nature of how we work with the superintendent and with the with the policies they impact all of those things but I, I guess I worry I don't know I, I worry about I, I feel like people feel like we can fix more than sometimes we can actually you bring up a very good point this is something uh, Meg brought up and we talked about adding something what is it that we don't do? What's not in our purview, right? That we don't want people to think that if you bring us a particular problem, we can solve it. Right. 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 So there is a chain of command that we want to go through. So we had thought about either adding it in here to say, what is it that we don't do? Or add it more in an FAQ section that I have a problem with my, you know, mm -hmm. in this particular area. Can the school committee help me with this? And then we say, what we recommend is you have to go through the chain of command. And if everything else fails, you obviously can bring your issue to the school committee and we will listen to you and we will 
look to work with the administration, something to that effect, right? So I, uh, so that part is still to be clearly defined, right? And we're not saying that we put this out there because I think there's more work to be done on all the pages. We have to define all the subcommittees, you know, the blurbs on the subcommittees. Um, so there is some work on that front too. Could I suggest maybe to keep, because the, the, the message that you're conveying in these first two bullets, we could keep the language and maybe put it in the second paragraph so that our responsibilities are outlined in those bottom three bullets, but then the other things that we do are included in this next paragraph to fulfill okay. and support these functions. We okay. listen to and understand mm -hmm. the needs of the superintendent and the That's community. So we have the same okay. language. Yes. It's just switched around. Switched. Okay. Yes. I like that. Good. Yeah. It makes absolute sense, Ms. Debler. I, I like that because I think it incorporates Yes. What we both yes. Yeah. Do you want something around what uh, we don't do in this page, or would you prefer it in an FAQ section? Because I don't want to say we do this, and then in the same place, hey, hey, hey well, but this is what we don't do, right? So I don't want us to shy away from the ownership we do have. We are there to listen. Um, I don't know if we should put the what we don't do here, or should we put it in FAQ? So just FAQs. throwing it out there. Yeah. FAQs. I FAQ? Think FAQs. This is the landing page. Negative. Right, exactly. Right. Yeah. And I don't want it to come off as negative. It's right. like, if you have a question, if we can't help you, here's where you should go. Right. As opposed to, this is what we don't I, do. I, you know? I like the wording on that. I, I okay. did have a little suggestion for an addition. Okay. If you all can bear to hear it and stay awake at the same time. Um, in between the... Um, the third from the last paragraph and the second to last paragraph, I thought about just inserting the authority of the school committee comes from the body, not from any particular individual. That's the a good point. The school committee members have no special rights or privileges other than those of parents and citizens. Yeah, mm. that's good. Just to clarify. So I have a, I have a thought now. I think we need to stop the e-meeting and have a physical meeting now. And let's let's take a stab on um, also the subcommittees and liaisons. Let's do a first cut, and then we can reach out to uh, for feedback. Right? You have a good start, though. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you for making us feel good like that. <laughs> no, it is a good start. It's uh, it's when you're creating something where there's not something already. It's it's more work. I know. I know. <laughs> you're not like cutting and editing from what's already there. You're starting from scratch. No, so. and it's also like your beliefs and there's so many things mixed in, and it's important to hear all of your beliefs, and that has to go in here. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Thank you for all your right. feedback. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, and then, so that brings us down to, um, I have to scroll, I think future agenda items was the thing in the one, um, yeah, I, just to kind of keep a rolling tab on things that we have already brought up that we would like to keep moving forward. I think we had talked some over the summer about elevating some of the diversity work, and I think we have, it, that's continuing to be a work in progress, would be my thought on that. I'm not sure that we need to call it out in here at this point right now, but to continue in that regard, uh, at our October 18th meeting, I think you're all aware, um, the HDCA will be coming in to give a report on work that they have been doing. I had a, a very nice meeting uh, this morning with them, kind of looking at what we're, at how we're shaping our agenda for the next, the next meeting. So I also have had a request, um, CPAC would also like to come give an update to us on the stuff that they have doing, have been doing, and they are either going to come, I think, on the 18th or perhaps uh, in the, on the November 1st meeting. Okay. Yeah, Nancy, I'm just wondering, you know, I don't want to put this just on you. There were some items that we had brought up in the past. I recall a couple of them that come to my mind. One was around differentiation, that what is it that we offer today, and, um, you know, where is there yeah. Some some update on the differentiation uh, that's offered in our schools. The second one that comes to mind is technology, where we invest so much. You know, we had talked about all that money that we were putting into the laptops and iPads and whatnot, but to actually see the impact of it, how is it helping our kids? So, 
can I make a suggestion and, and you can shoot me down if it's not what you're no, it, that's what, fine. What, what does not make sense but the technology might be nicely incorporated when the director of technology comes and brings his budget presentation that he he often has visuals and things mm -hmm. that he could give an update along with that um, I'm okay with that I'm just thinking that they, these are some of the items yeah. and I don't know how we can bring them up and I think the third one um, Ms. Parson and Dr. Kavanaugh shared a lot of information with me on ELL, and I didn't get back to you, but I do think that it would really be nice to bring it back to the entire committee and to the community. And I think Jill is a fantastic, uh, you know, energetic person who does so much in the district. So it will really be a good opportunity for everyone to see someone like her um, who's working in our district. Mm -hmm. So just, she's amazing. Right. Yes. yes. Just so I have this right. Um, sure. So. The first one is looking for a report on differentiation, differentiation that is offered in our district. What are some of the choices that are okay. available? So that is a report for that technology, does that make sense to that, accompany that's with the fine. budget? Yes. And then ELL, we would perhaps, would there be an opportunity? I don't know if, is, does she make us, will she be making a specific budget request or is that no, falling that falls under? into Jen's budget. Okay. Yeah. Into so, the assistant superintendent yeah, right, right, something to the effect of why do they even need it? Uh, I would want to start there, if you don't mind. Why do kids need this, this service? Okay. Beyond, you mean beyond the legal mandate? You mean like what, under what circumstances, under what? Mm -hmm. Right, right. I mean, I had shared my story that mm -hmm. uh, in a South Asian, especially an Indian household, it's very common to hear three languages at the same time. And we never had these special services. We spoke Telugu at my household because my father was insistent you have to learn your, uh, you know, mother tongue. When I went outside and played with my friends, we lived in a Hindi belt, so we spoke Hindi. But the medium of instruction in school was English. And um, I, my own personal experience alone, I did fine. And same for my son who grew up here. He heard three languages at home growing up from the time he was a baby. He heard English, he heard Telugu, he heard Hindi. Uh, he didn't hear Tamil because my husband didn't choose to speak Tamil. But he would have probably heard four languages. And he did fine without um, the services. So I'm just wondering where are those instances where we need it. And I, I do think that there are instances where those are needed. But I think there are certain uh, places where it's very normal culturally to hear all these languages. So there are parents wondering, why is my child pulled out from a math class to go to EL service? Um, it's taking away from that. So, so just that flavor, hearing that would also be helpful. You were saying I just, something? I, I just in my mind, I was thinking of a parallel to special education and, and not wanting to bring something beyond the meeting. If there's a way to address, if parents don't want services, is there a way that they can refuse yeah, services I mean, in the I same way? We can give an overview and we can yeah. talk a little bit about that part of the process. Um, we could kind of share a day in the life of you know, what, what, what do EL services look like? Sure. But in terms of the reason behind it, why we do it, it really isn't a question that we can answer. It's federally mandated. We, you know, when Jill shared that information, it is so prescriptive um, because it, it civil rights, it, it's yeah. federally regulated. So we can't really get it. We, I mean, we can talk a little bit about the different profiles of learners and how EL supports, uh, assist those students and help kind of level the playing field for them and help them develop the skills they need to be successful. Um, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I'm just sharing a very different perspective here. Um, and all I'm asking is that if we can hear it directly from the parents of kids who have had it and have felt we didn't need it and, you know, what is their experience like? And perhaps this is time to bubble this information up you know, you have those connections, whether it's DESI or whichever level it needs to go to, um, it may not be needed in every instance. So again, I, I know this is not on the agenda, yeah. so we so, won't talk about it, just hoping you. to see it as an agenda item. Um, again, I'm a big fan of Jill, um, so I'd like to see, hear from her. She has a lot of experience, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
Nancy, <clears throat> one of the many highlights of these school committee meetings for me is when the student council comes yes. to speak. And wouldn't yes. it be great to get representatives from each of the schools to come say a few words every now and then? I do enjoy it. Little marathoners other. come in and tell us about the playground. Yeah. So it seems like we could occasionally have some of the. It, it is a highlight no, when we have actual students come in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it is a highlight for me, too. Yeah. Okay. Love that idea. I like keeping the students right in the focus. Yeah. So. All right, then at this point, we have our next opportunity for public comment. I see, unless there are people hiding back there, uh, that we have no public left at this point. <laughs> um, and we will move into items by consensus. Okay. Um, as superintendent, I recommend that the school committee vote to approve oh, sorry, um, the following items by consensus uh, as included in your packet. So, so moved. Second. So motion by Jen, second by Meg. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Yes. And so that passes. And now we are at the point where I would seek a motion for adjournment should people wish to adjourn. So moved. And motion by Mina and a second. Yes. By Meg. All those in favor? Yes. yes. So thank you very much. Uh, I will see everybody at our next regular meeting, which is on October 18th, here in the high school at 7 p.m. Thanks and have a good night. And thank you, Nancy. 10 p.m. on the nose. Oh, yes, and it is 10 p.m. on the nose.